Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 177. Today, we are going to be covering a very difficult case to talk about, Um, one that is ongoing that many of you probably are aware of because it's been on national news. I mean, it's reaching other countries at this point, too. Yeah, it's around the world at this Mm -hmm. point. So, yeah, this is a really, really big case. Yes, we are going to be talking about Gabby Petito. Um, A couple weeks ago, we started getting a ton of requests to talk about Gabby Petito when she was missing and also about Jelani Day. And we have been looking at both cases and working on putting information together. So I just wanted to let you guys know that we have put um, the Jelani Day case on hold because of the heartbreaking news that came out this week. He, they found his body and we're still waiting for a lot of information to come out in order to put that you know, together. Yeah, and we, we are going to do an episode on it. We're just giving it a little bit of time to yeah. get some more information so that we can really do a full deep dive on yes. the case. Yes, I mean, that's, yeah, I don't want to jump and make... Yeah, you yeah. don't want to go too early because, I mean, a lot of these investigations move quickly, especially mm-hmm. you know when there's big news like that where you're you know recovering a body and things yeah. like that. So I mean, everything took a different turn and there's been a major lack of media coverage, information available, and press conferences. It is really frustrating when there's such limited information available on a case, yet with Gabby Petito's, there's been tons of information coming out. I know every case is different, and we don't know the circumstances behind that or why that is, but we have been able to pull together a lot more information on Gabby's case, so we decided we would go ahead and kind of follow up to the video that I put out on my YouTube channel this week. After Kendall did her video, I watched that, of course, and just going through it, there were so many things that I felt like I could comment on and just some thoughts that I had about sort of how this whole thing has unfolded and some of the evidence that's out there. There's lots and lots of footage of this case, which I think makes it different than some of the other cases out there. It's just there's so much media coverage. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one of the biggest reasons why this case has just gone so viral is the body cam footage Mm -hmm. i mean i think that was some of the first footage that came out with this case and people saw that and obviously you know were moved by what was going on in it and put it online and you know with the power of tiktok and and social media platforms these days it's very yeah relatively easy to to get things to go viral and i think just you know the overall intrigue of of this story just kind of has spurred everybody to really kind of wonder what happened like what's the real story here so and i think what makes it unique is we are dealing with a full nationwide manhunt at this point you know right and that doesn't happen very often especially in these cases you know going from a missing person to now there's this guy on the run and i think that's kind of just captured everybody's interest like yeah and especially what's the since- mystery where is he and you know the fbi has called out for as much attention and awareness and I was going to say having the FBI on this case Mm -hmm. and really leading the investigation really has just brought so much more attention to it. I mean, the FBI Mm -hmm. doesn't get involved in, you know, every missing persons case out there. So the fact that they're involved with this one because it's crossing multiple states and, you know, there's a lot of other factors in play. But we also wanted to do this episode to kind of clear up some of the rumors that have been going on and give people the facts here, you know, and I think that's really important as well with how viral everything has gone because the amount of misinformation and fake things, fake accounts that have been made, that have been spread, it's just, yeah. it's constant. Just the other day, there was another uh, fake call to the police saying mm-hmm. that Brian was at the house and there was gunshots. Yeah, there was yep. gun. I was just about to say, yep, gunshots at the house. It was all fake, but the police had to waste their time coming out to the house and looking. And there's been several instances like that of just absolute bullshit videos of from Brian's phone posts yeah. from Brian's Facebooks. And um, we just want to stick to the facts here, clear up as much as we can. And of course, by the time this episode goes live, it takes us a couple days to edit and get it all ready to go for you guys. Uh, there might be some more information, but we will leave that, you know, in a pinned comment or insert a little update at the end. If there's anything major so i just want to make that clear we are recording on september 26th mm-hmm. and this is going live i believe the tw- uh, 29th mm-hmm. yes yep. yes okay so with that being said you ready to get into this 
Yeah, before we do, though, I just wanted to put oh, it out there right. that I probably sound a little congested. I think Kendall sounds a little congested, too. Last week, we tried to take some time off and, and go to yeah. Seattle, see my parents, and just try to enjoy a little bit of relaxation and literally got off the plane and was super sick, just snot running out of the nose and just got a fever and everything. And, and I got COVID tested. Um, I'm vaccinated and both tests were, were negative. So it wasn't COVID. It was just a really, really nasty sinus yeah. infection, I believe. And then so, he passed it to me. And then I passed it to you. So, so we both kind of sound nasally. We're, we're at the end of it, I think. But yeah. yeah, just in case you're like, God, you guys sound terrible. Like, <laughs> it's because we've got some some gunk still in there. It's but just like residual. Yeah, it's not but, fun. Yeah, bear with us. But uh, this episode of Mile Higher is brought to you by Modern Fertility, the Pill Club, Halo Collar, Simply Safe, and Quip. And one of the things we wanted to to mention right here at the beginning oh, is yes. that we are going to be making a $5,000 donation to the Gabby Petito Foundation, which is almost set up if it's not already set up by now. I know there's a link, there's a website already stood up for the yeah. Gabby Petito Foundation, but we're gonna go ahead and donate $5,000 from the revenue from this episode to that foundation. Yeah, her father tweeted about it um, yesterday. Here's what he said. The Gabby Petito Foundation, no one should have to find their child on their own. We are creating this foundation to give resources and guidance to bringing their children home you know, to other children, I'm sure he meant. We are looking to help people in similar situations as Gabby. GabbyPetitoFoundation.org. If you would like to make a donation, we will be making the 5,000 donation from today's episode. And I also have, if you would like to go over and watch my video, if you haven't seen it, we have that monetized with extra ads. And so far we've, we've raised over $10,000 that we will be donating as well. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I think it's always, you know, in such tragic times to you know where a family tries to take that that you know experience yes. and yeah. try to help other people mm -hmm. you know when you're go when they're going through so much grief and just i can't even imagine the emotions they're feeling to also be thinking about helping others yeah, and yeah. putting up a foundation as quickly as they're doing uh, they're doing it is just really really cool to see and, and props to the petito family uh, for doing that. I think it's, it's really so inspirational. It really is to be in one of the worst, the worst time yeah, of your whole life, life, most likely. And, you know, be in absolute despair, still yeah. trying to get justice, you know, trying, knowing that Brian's out there dealing with the public speculation, yeah. the public spotlight, and they still are thinking of others right. and wanting to help other people in her honor. That's just it's so moving. So brave. Oh, it makes me emotional I know, talking me about too. it because I just can't imagine what they're going through. Like you said, and still wanting to help others in this horrible time. Um, mm -hmm. It's just so wonderful. And I'm sure Gabby would be so thankful and so proud of her family for turning such a tragic and heartbreaking thing into something to help others. I think she know, would too. Give others hope. I think she would too. And it really embodies who she was. It sounds like just from the multitude of witness, I mean, not witnesses, um, friends and family mm -hmm. interviews. She seemed like such a, she had such a, lust for life mm -hmm. you know that she was genuine and had a pure heart and just seeing her family speak about her today watched her memorial was uh, absolutely devastating i i just can't imagine what they're how they're even functioning eating sleeping doing mm -hmm. anything how do you how do you move on mm -hmm. yeah you know like it's just it's so 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 sad i think for any parent it's the worst case scenario for your child to leave the earth before you do yeah. it's and it's something com yeah i was gonna say it's something completely unnatural to just the human psyche and and especially in this way mm -hmm. and you know thinking about the potential last moments that she you know was on this earth has got to be extremely difficult to process and then to just know that the person who allegedly you know murdered your child is is just out there on the run and not only that his <sighs> parents so are not involved at all and are seemingly protecting him which you yeah. know we don't know that for sure but mm -hmm. it seems just from the fact that they literally have released what one statement yeah about this whole thing that mm -hmm. was like rest in peace may gabby rest in about, peace regarding or gabby that right yeah. right it's one statement so it's just I, I think i think one of the reasons why this has gone so viral too is it's it's very relatable for people and i think a lot of people can and especially the younger generation if you think this went 
viral on TikTok. Well, I mean, if you look at demographics of TikTok, it's going to be much younger mm -hmm. than you know a lot of other forms of media. Uh, media. Yeah. So it would make sense. I mean, Gabby looks. I mean, she's a young, young was a young, young girl, and so I think a lot of people just really resonate with mm -hmm. with her and and just the whole situation. And I mean, yeah. And I think another reason why it did go viral, as we keep saying is partly because Gabby did have a following. She had, you know, a couple hundred thousand followers, I believe, under just under 200,000 followers before she went missing. So, you know, people were aware of her and she had people to kind of spread initially what was going on. Um, but yeah, terribly terribly sad story and let's just hope let's just hope we find Brian alive and we can get the answers that this family deserves and justice for Gabby Petito. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and start by talking about who Gabby is, where she came from, and how she met Brian, how they ended up together in the van trying to live this off-grid lifestyle. So Gabrielle Petito, who went by Gabby, was born on March 19th, 1999. She was from Blue Point, Long Island, New York, and was very close with her parents, her step-parents, and her younger siblings. So her father, Joe Petito, remarried her stepmom, Tara, and they had two kids. And then her mom, Nicole, remarried Jim Schmidt. And at least one of the kids, Gabby's brother, TJ, was a few years younger than her. But Gabby was very close with all of her siblings. Gabby is described as a talented, sweet, creative, and adventurous spirit who enjoyed yoga, drawing, reading, and had deep appreciation for nature. She loved hiking and she loved traveling. She wanted to see as much of the world as she could. In 2017, she graduated from Bayport Blue Point High School and spent a few years traveling, gaining some life experience. Here's a clip of Gabby in 2019. I love all the events that they do down here in the summer, um, like live after five. Okay, ready, set, go. Happy birthday, Noel. Perfect. That was obviously just from a little cafe birthday thing wherever she worked um but you can just see she's such a you know upbeat friendly person in 2019 march she started dating brian laundry who was a friend from high school their first date was sushi on the beach and the two of them apparently hit it off right away so brian was born on november 18th 1997 his parents are chris and roberta laundry he has an older sister named Cassie who was born in 1989. Brian's known to be a nature enthusiast, loves to travel, a minimalist, even is known as a barefoot hiker and an environmentalist. So wait, barefoot hiker. I didn't really know that that was a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's people that are, I mean, if you're a true, you know, minimalist and environmentalist, I mean, you're going to be trying to I mean, to barefoot hike, if you think about it, it's going to give you the strongest connection to nature and the that earth must as be you why. hike. Yeah. The I mean, connection. Yeah. It's, it's more about the feeling the earth under your feet and, you it know, seems it's kind of how people used to do it back. Dangerous though. Yeah. I mean, you could step on all sorts of things, but a lot of people do it or people hike in those, mm -hmm. you know, those shoes that are in the form of feet that just oh, kind of like, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's kind of similar to Almost that. like gloves. Yeah, exactly. But as far as we know, the Laundry family loved Gabby, and Cassie said she was like a sister to her, and that her own kids adored Gabby quite a bit. So in 2019, Brian and Gabby did a cross-country trip together in a Nissan Sentra. They drove from the East Coast to California and Oregon, camping along the way, visiting cities, beaches, mountains, and national parks. They enjoyed the trip, but decided that a Nissan Sentra, that's pretty tough to travel all that ways in. Uh, so they decided that they needed a larger vehicle. In 2020, they started converting Gabby's white 2012 Ford Transit van into a camper. And this is something that is like all the rage right now. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, there's tons of people that are doing it. I feel like it's kind of this new wave of, mm -hmm. of living and, and traveling is like getting a van, outfitting it into a camper or, you know, putting a bed in it and you know kitchen things like that so that you can really live on the road yeah it's really cool honestly. it is cool honestly I, I really wish that we could have done that but that's, that's <laughs> we could never live like ago. that we are way too messy and disorganized to like live I'm in such a small space to live in a 
camper. Not to mention we have a, 10 pets. Well, yeah. that's what I was going to say. Is We'd be cuddling. Yeah. It'd smell like a zoo in there. As yeah. soon as we got our, our cats, we kind yeah. of... That dream went out the window. Well, I guess if we just stuck to cats, we probably could have taken them with us. There's plenty of people that three cats, cats like three well, cats, not all uh, three of them. If we stopped at two, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> we just have no self control. But because <laughs> I mean, the whole purpose of this is like you downsize your whole life yeah. to mm-hmm. to live very minimally. You know, it is really cool, and you know, obviously there are many channels out there who are much further into this than Gabby or had more funds than them to invest in a bigger. I mean, I've seen a lot bigger trailers that look like, Oh, I could sleep in one of those at least a few nights. But (laughs) even this one, their van gives me claustrophobia. It's It's basically enough to fit their bed in the back. And they kind of made like shelving on the top and put some plants. Like she definitely made it cute and really made an effort to make this a nice space for them. And I think though, it's still really small. They, tent camped a lot i mean a lot of people Mm -hmm. tent camp when they do this even though they have a van or i watch a couple youtubers that have jeeps or trucks and they have tents that they pop up at these spaces rather Mm -hmm. than living in like a hard shell van or camper they're just they sleep in a tent well i know a lot of the time brian said that he was sleeping in a hammock like he would just put it up in the tree so maybe some nights they would get kind of some space and she could take the full bed and he would sleep in the hammock i think a lot of people also park somewhere at some park or whatever and then they do a huge hike and then once they get to the summit they spend the night there and then they hike back slowly the next day back to their right um van yeah that would that would make sense too mm-hmm. yeah it's a cool lifestyle and and it really was gabby's dream she wanted to document their travels on Instagram. She had dreams of starting a blog, possibly a YouTube channel, um, all under nomadic static. But she posted most of her travels on Instagram through her personal Instagram, which is Gabs Petito. If you want to go see it, her her page is just stunning. She got to see a lot of beautiful places, which does make me feel a little sense of peace knowing that that was so important to her to travel. And she did get to see a lot of a lot of beautiful places in this earth before she was taken from it. Mm-hmm. So Gabby's first post to her Instagram with Brian was in March of 2020. This was a few days before she turned 21. And the caption says a whole year's worth of adventures and stories down. Cheers, little cheersing emoji and a lifetime to go. Then on July 2nd, 2020, Gabby announced on Instagram that they were engaged And she said, every day is such a dream with you. The families all got together to celebrate. They were all really happy for Brian and Gabby. Chris and Roberta welcomed Gabby into their family, so much so that Brian and Gabby moved in with them. They all lived together at their home in Northport, Florida. This was really fun for Gabby. She was able to explore a bunch of interesting areas in Florida, a bunch of beaches, because she had, you know, spent a lot of time in New York growing up. So... During all this time, they're continuing to work on their van and traveling when they can for short trips. But they wanted to plan a big second cross-country trip in 2021. Gabby decided to quit her job as a nutritionist. That was reported by several sources that that's what she was doing. We're not sure if she was a full certified nutritionist or if she was kind of working up to that. But they left all of that behind and downsized and prepared to live sustainably on the road. And Gabby really embraced Brian's minimalist lifestyle. She started to work on their website, nomadicstatic.com, and planned to turn their van life adventures into a blog. In March 2021, the couple celebrated Gabby's 22nd birthday in Georgia, where they hiked the Appalachian Trail. Now, this is an interesting point that we'll come back to later on because there's been a lot of speculation about Brian's whereabouts and one of the places that seems like could potentially be where Brian's hiding out, according to uh, a friend uh, that put a tip in pretty much that he could be hiding out in the Appalachian Mountains. But we'll talk about that more later. In June 2021, Gabby's dad and stepmom, Joe and Tara, relocated to Vero Beach, Florida. And they did this because they wanted to be closer to Gabby. And Vero Beach is just a few hours from Northport. On June 17, 2021, Gabby and Brian were up in New York for her brother's high school graduation. And then afterwards, on July 2nd, this is when the second cross-country trip officially began. The plan was to go on a four-month trip, visiting multiple national parks, all through Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming, ending at a family friend's place in Portland around Halloween. Gabby promised to stay in touch with her parents and post regularly on Instagram. 
And at the point in this journey, we don't really know exactly how many followers she had, but she did have, she was growing a following. On July 4th, Gabby made her first post from this trip. The location was tagged Monument Rocks Natural Landmark in Gove County, Kansas. Also on July 4th, Brian posted tagging the same location from his Instagram account at Bizarre Design. And then on July 8th, Gabby posted tagging Colorado Springs, actually. And then July 10th and 11th, they posted down in the Colorado's Great Sand Dunes National Park and Preserve, which we've been to. Really, really cool spot. Yeah. So I would see why they'd want to go see that. Definitely yeah. worth checking out if you've never seen the Great Sand Dunes. It's really a kind of bizarre. I mean, you don't really think of giant dunes of sand for Colorado, but here they are just sitting at the bottom of of the mountains, which is pretty cool. And it looks like they went on a beautiful day. It looks gorgeous. I'm so it glad does. she the pictures got to do are amazing. This. Yeah, and they went sandboarding, which is really cool. You can sandboard down the dunes. Um, so they were there together on July 10th and 11th. The post on Gabby's Instagram from July 11th was captioned that it was their last day in Colorado and that they were going to be heading to Utah. Then on July 16th and 18th, Gabby posted tagging Utah Zion National Park, and it included pictures of their campsite. Another really, really beautiful place yeah. that we haven't visited yet. I know. I would love to see Utah. So July 16th, 17th, and 18th, Brian also posted and tagged Zion as well. July 21st and July 22nd, Gabby posted again and tagged Utah's Bryce Canyon National Park. On the July 22nd post, she said that it had rained every night that they had spent in the national parks. July 23rd and 24th, Brian posted again, also tagging Bryce Canyon National Park. And I know we're just going through a lot of dates here, but it's important that you understand the timeline as best as we can from their social media posts because it really kind of paints a picture of how everything was going in their lives. So July 26th, Gabby posted tagging Mystic Hot Springs in Monroe, Utah. July 29th, Brian posted tagging Canyonlands National Park in Utah. July 30th and 31st, Gabby posted also tagging Canyonlands National Park. And then Gabby didn't post again for 12 days. That could have been spotty reception, of course. You know, there's not great yeah, service in the national are parks. Very remote areas mm -hmm. with little service. But she did promise her family that she would do her best to post as often as she could to keep everyone, family and friends, up to date on where they were. So August 12th, Gabby finally posted again, tagging Arches National Park in Grand County, Utah. She said that they had hiked a usually busy trail to the Delicate Arch early that morning, but they didn't see many people. Then on August 19th, Gabby posted her first video to YouTube. Gabby started the channel Nomadic Static back in 2013, but as far as we know, nothing was posted to it unless it was removed. But this was the first and only video that had been posted, and it was kind of a compilation of all of her travels with Brian up until this point. Hello, hello, and good morning. <laughs> It is really nice and sunny today. Brian's stretching, doing some morning yoga. We are right outside Capitol Reef right now in a uh, free dispersed camp spot. And we've been lucky so far at all the places we've stayed, but I'd say this is one of the best so far. Since we left New York, I've only set up my hammock once. Then on August 19th, Gabby posts again. But what was different than all of her previous posts is she had no location tagged, which is something Gabby always did, you know, letting her followers know where they were. This time it was a picture of the inside of the van and also a picture from above the van. I'm guessing they just took that with a drone and the caption tagged Brian's account. And it talked about a man in the park who didn't throw away his, quote, processed pre-packaged plastic conglomerate of lunch garbage. Hmm. Brian was very outspoken against waste and plastic water bottles. He made many of his posts like that. Oftentimes the captions were relating to something around that. So there's speculation that this was not posted by Gabby. Potentially. Yeah, speculation. Yeah. We because I think no idea. One thing people have pointed out is that the picture from inside the van doesn't match up from Canyonlands mm. where they were. Right. I mean, if you look at the landscape out the back of the van, this looks like prairie. This almost looks like Colorado yeah. or something like that. And then the yeah. aerial pick of the van seems like it's on the beach. Yeah. I mean, it's just like sand. 
Yeah, it's certainly it's like an odd. older picture. I mean, of course, anyone can post old photos to Instagram. A lot of people delay their photo posting and post a week later, or weeks later from something else. But yeah, it's it's peculiar for sure. Especially when you go to her Instagram and you kind of look at her flow of pictures and, mm -hmm. you know, people kind of have sort of their theme to it. And this picture just seems completely out of place Yeah, compared to the previous five or six pictures mm -hmm. where it's pictures of her in the current location she's in. And the fact that it wasn't geotagged is a, definitely a, a big red flag. Yeah. Because so she did that in order mm -hmm. to update her friends and family where she was. But yeah, and I believe it helps other people who are interested in those areas get served your content. Yeah. Or people who are in van life or whatever else, you know. Exactly. Um, so then August 21st, Gabby's dad, Jim, talked to her in a FaceTime call. And he ended up sending her an Uber Eats order of pizza to Gabby and Brian, who were staying in a hotel in Salt Lake City. And they couldn't order it themselves because there was a power outage and they had no Wi-Fi. So, you know, that's that makes it kind of difficult. Obviously, she was alive at the point that that photo was posted on August 19th. But did he control her phone? Did he post for her? That's, right, that's right. a possibility. Um, but yeah, that's completely speculative. We have no idea. It really could have been Gabby posting those pictures. So then August 24th, they were still in Salt Lake City at the hotel near the airport. And this was confirmed by hotel staff. Gabby had a FaceTime call with her mom. She talked to her mom three times per week normally. And Gabby said that they were leaving Utah and heading to Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And after that, they planned to head over to Yellowstone National Park. August 25th, Gabby's last Instagram post has no location tagged. It was a series of photos of Gabby in front of a monarch butterfly mural that actually is in Ogden, Utah. It's now become a huge uh, kind of place for people to pay their respect. There's a ton of flowers there and people praying for Gabby and her family. But she was holding a small crocheted pumpkin in the photo and the caption said, Happy Halloween. But again, this was not tagged. But the last photo in this series of photos doesn't really fit the series. It's a very blurry image of Gabby holding up her phone. Also, on August 25th, Gabby's mom, Nicole, talked to Gabby on the phone, and Gabby said that they were near Grand Teton National Park. Nicole also got a text from Gabby. Then on August 27th, Nicole received another text from Gabby and also assumed that it was sent from the Tetons. Then August 30th, there was a final text to Nicole from Gabby that said no service in Yosemite. And we will also go over a few more bits of her final text messages later in this episode. This is interesting to me, this last series of photos. I'm just looking through it. And it's interesting how, A, they were posting pictures of, you know, being in these remote locations, and then randomly they have a picture of her seemingly back in civilization. But also, Happy Halloween, and this mm -hmm. was posted in August. Yeah, that's, that's pretty early. Like, but it's also kind of a thing. Is it? That as soon as... Fall yeah. hits, you say happy Halloween. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. It's a total thing, especially with girls and people oh, really, really interesting. into Halloween. So you don't think there's any possibility this is just kind of a photo dump from somebody else to create the illusion that she's... Oh, I think it's totally possible. I'm just saying it is possible it was posted by her. And then to leave a blurry photo? Because people do post Halloween, like say happy Halloween as early as August. A lot of people start their Halloween celebrations in like the beginning of August. Okay. I'm serious. <laughs> All right. I know I some of our homies out there people are, know what I guess I'm talking people about. Who already Halloween. has their Halloween decorations out? I bet a lot of you do. Yeah, I, I guess so. But anyway, I mean, I still think it's incredibly weird and suspicious. It doesn't really fit with her flow of photos either. No. They're not edited how she normally would. And then, yeah, that last one just seems like it was almost That's accidentally like added yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Why would Which you is post easy a to do on Instagram, like. accidentally add another one to your, while you're selecting. I do that all the time. But you don't think Gabby would go back after the fact and fix that? Like, right. clearly she cares about her Instagram, so yeah. mm -hmm. why would you leave that in there? Yeah, I don't know. It's very strange. Just something doesn't add up with it. Before we continue with the timeline of her disappearance, we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be right back. Imagine if every crime could be halted before it happened. Well... While you can't stop every criminal in their tracks, what if you could deter them? That's what Simply Safe's new wireless outdoor security camera does. 
It's wireless, so it can install anywhere. Extending simply saves perimeter defense from your windows and doors to the far corners of your property. That's right, Simply Safe, the system that the U.S. News and World Report names best home security system of 2021, just got even better. This brand new outdoor security camera is engineered with all the advanced tech to help keep you and your family safe. It has an ultra wide 140 degree field of view, so you can keep watch over your entire yard. It has a 1080p HD resolution with an eight times zoom. This means you can zoom in and clearly see things like faces and license plates to capture critical evidence. And it has an easy to remove rechargeable battery so it doesn't need an outlet and can go literally anywhere on your property. This camera has it all and it integrates with your Simply Safe home security system, extending its protection to the outside. Together, it means every door, window, and room are protected and now your property will be too. Absolutely pumped about this outdoor security camera. I love Simply Safe. It is the most affordable and just overall best value for a security system out there. I switched from some of the big security companies and I'll never go back. To learn more about the exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, visit simplysafe.com slash mile higher. Simply Safe is offering 20% off your entire new system and your first month of monitoring service free when you enroll in an interactive monitoring. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash mile higher. Guys, we're all looking for ways to make our lives easier, whether that's delivery for dinner or ordering our favorite products online. So why should getting birth control be any different? Well, with Pill Club, they make it easy to get your birth control without scheduling a trip to the doctor's office or going to the pharmacy in person. They provide access to care from the comfort of your home and delivery right to your door in discreet packaging. The Pill Club is a birth control subscription prescribed by a medical professional and delivered straight to your door for free. The Pill Club carries over 120 FDA-approved brands, and most brands of birth control are free with insurance or Medicaid. Otherwise, prices start as low as $9 per month without insurance. What's also great is you can text their licensed medical team at any time if you have any questions. And of course, it's always great to skip a trip to the doctors if you don't have to go just to get your birth control or waiting in line at the pharmacy for birth control. It makes it so much easier. So join the club. Right now, when you go to thepillclub.com slash mile higher, the Pill Club is offering a $10 donation to bedsider.org for every mile higher podcast listener who becomes a patient. Your donation will help low income individuals get access to birth control through bedsider.org. That's thepillclub.com slash mile higher to get your first birth control care package and donate to help more women in need of affordable birth control. Remember, thepillclub.com slash mile higher. You must use that link to make your donation. My dogs are a huge part of our family. That's why when it comes to keeping Oakley, Lucy, Bernie, and Sadie safe, happy, and secure, I knew that Halo collar was the only collar I would use. Halo is the only smart system with a collar that trains, tracks, and protects your dog so they can safely run free. With the Halo collar, you can create Halo fences. You can set up Halo fences by walking the perimeter with your collar or at the touch of your finger in the Halo app. You can set custom feedback and train with natural, simple, profound communication via the custom feedback you set for your dog. It can even include your voice. My favorite thing is that you can view their location and status at any time and stay connected to your dogs and see how they're doing from activity to safety status any time you want. It gives you that peace of mind if you have a dog that gets out a lot or jumps the fence. This will always be able to help you track them down if they escape their yard. Because the GPS works without cell, or Wi-Fi, and you can create up to 20 fences instantly. The included 21-day training program sets you up for success as well. Get to know Halo and check out the 90-second video on shophalocollar.com slash milehire to just see how easy it is to set up and use. I got these collars set up on my dogs in literally like five minutes, and I'll never go back. I'll never use another smart collar again. This just really solved all the issues I was having with the smart collars in the past. I love that you get not only an invisible fence option, but you also get the GPS uh, and safety and security with the Halo collar, so you can always know where your dogs are. But the training part of it is really, really unique and one piece that I absolutely love about the Halo collar. So get the peace of mind you're looking for and take advantage of the special limited time introductory offer today and save 20% on your Halo collar by going to shophalocollar.com slash mile That's shophalocollar.com slash mile to save 20%. 
You must go to this site to get this offer, and it can only be gotten here. ShopHaloColor.com slash MileHigher. During the first week of September, Nicole and Gabby's stepdad, Jim, didn't hear from Gabby again after that text saying, I'm in uh, the Yosemite National Park. I don't have service. And it was weird because her Instagram account wasn't updated either. There was no posts or stories. They contacted her dad and stepmom, Joe and Tara, as well as other family members and friends, but no one had heard from Gabby since late August. They also tried to contact Chris and Roberta, Brian's parents. They sent texts and left messages for them, but nobody ever heard back from them, which I'm sure that was not a good sign for Gabby's family to just all of a sudden not get anything back from Brian's family. Yeah, that instantly freaked them out. On Friday, September 10th, Nicole talked to the Suffolk County Sheriff's Department And later she said that they didn't take her concerns seriously at all. On Saturday, September 11th, Nicole proceeded to file a missing persons report. Wednesday, September 1st, Brian apparently arrived at his parents' house. We don't know for sure that that's when he arrived, but that's what they're telling us. And, you know, other neighbors have seen him around this time. We just don't know if he came back earlier, possibly. But this would mean that he drove back to Northport, Florida incredibly fast, and he was driving Gabby's van, but of course without Gabby. So if he came from Wyoming, Jackson, Wyoming, it would be 36 hours to Northport. If he came from Yosemite, which we don't know if they ever actually went there, it would be 42 hours. So within a two days period, there's no way one dude drives that that many hours and makes it back. Like you literally have to not stop pretty much at all and just fuck like you have to be like peeing in a water bottle yeah that i mean which people have done while driving i don't even know if a truck no sleeping just just yeah i guess he could have i mean yeah if you google maps it yeah in theory you could have but that is like pretty bizarre in my especially when you're in a van you're not flying down the road at 90 miles you know what i mean like yeah Mm -hmm. i mean what it seems to me is that he was already on his way back from florida prior to august 30th yeah i mean that scene he was hitchhiking before that i don't think they ever made it to yosemite i don't think there's any we don't know evidence to suggest they actually made it to yosemite that in fact because they also said they were going to go to yellowstone you go to grand tetons and then go to yellowstone i mean that's there's some distance between those two national parks and then to jet over all the way over to california to yosemite like that's there's just too much time and travel time there Mm. for the for the you know, the way that these texts line up, it just doesn't make sense at all. Like, and please keep in mind, guys, we're just working with the information available. There's going to be more that comes out in the yeah. future that will make all of this much more clear. We're just trying to make sense of this. Yeah. I'm just trying to deduce like the text. So August 27th, Nicole received another text from Gabby, assuming it was from the Tetons. And then all of a sudden there's a text saying, Oh, and we're now in Yosemite from the 27th to the 30th. That would imply that their plan of going to Yellowstone just never happened. And then they just decided to up and go to Yosemite all of a sudden. Or that was just a, a bait text. That was just there's no yeah. no truth behind that. It was just a text sent. Just wanted them someone his mom to think her mom, sorry, to think that they were in Yosemite. But then it makes absolutely no sense for him to show up on September first, even if they went mm-hmm. to Yosemite mm-hmm. and to make I mean that's a I mean either way. That's across Wyoming the country. Or, right. That's yeah. what I'm saying. What the nobody's fuck? nobody's getting back in two days by themselves driving across the country. I mean, Whoa. is it possible? Maybe, but yeah. realistically, no. Like I mean, that's the biggest thing right now. One of the biggest things I should say is no one can seem to figure out how he got back so fast or what his trip like was or what his pattern of driving was where how he even got back because they've given us no information all we know is that a neighbor saw him after september 1st around his property acting completely normal witnessed him mowing the lawn going for a nice bike ride with his mom and cleaning out gabby's van in the driveway well let's not forget too the couple up up near uh in wyoming that picked brian up that he hitchhiked with. Yeah, 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 I know. We're gonna get into that. I said earlier we're gonna get into that later. We'll go over. Oh, all really? That. Okay. Yeah, Miranda Baker. We'll talk okay. about that. That's a big piece of this. We just haven't gotten there yet. We're going in the order that information was received, mm-hmm. not in the order of that things happened. Yeah. Which it's a little difficult at this point, but that's the easiest way for us to do it. So then, September 11th, police officers from Northport Police Department tried to talk to Brian. 
His parents stopped them at the door and wouldn't let them talk to Brian or say anything about Gabby themselves. Then they referred the police to their attorney. After this, officers seized Gabby's van, the 2012 Ford Transit van with the Florida license plate QFT G03, which has been taken in to be processed as evidence. And obviously the search for Gabby has crossed multiple states and the FBI joined right away to make things a little less complicated and bring in more resources. So the Laundry family refused to cooperate with the investigation. Still to this day, they are refusing to cooperate at this time that we are recording. And Brian invoked his Fifth Amendment right. He's refusing to say anything that might incriminate him. And through his attorney, Brian put out a statement that he plans to remain in the background. How convenient. The only person that seems to have a conscience in this family is his sister, Cassie, who actually did talk to the media and spoke about how concerned she is about Gabby. And we will go ahead and play that clip now. Obviously, me and my family want Gabby to be found safe. She's like a sister and my children love her. And all I want is for her to come home safe and sound and this to be just a big misunderstanding. Gabby's family has also said that they believe that she cooperated with investigators too. Let's hope she's continuing to do that. Gabby's parents released an open letter to Roberta and Christopher Laundry and begged them for help. Christopher and Roberta Laundry, we are writing this letter to ask you to help find our daughter. We understand you are going through a difficult time and your instinct is strong to protect your son. We ask you to put yourselves in our shoes. We haven't been able to sleep or eat and our lives are falling apart. We believe you know the location of where Brian left Gabby. We beg you to tell us, as a parent, how could you let us go through this pain and not help us? Police officers have tried to talk to Brian multiple times with no luck when he was still there. Um, officers were seen canvassing the neighborhood, looking for him, looking for other possible witnesses, going around getting, you know, doorbell yeah. camera footage, all of that. And throughout all of this, people were protesting outside of the laundry home. Because, like, what the hell? I know. Why, you know, you supposedly love this person. Why are you not helping? Why aren't you coming forth and speaking out about what's... She why, lived with What them. happened? You clearly yeah. returned without her. So where mm -hmm. is she? Did mm -hmm. she want to be left behind somewhere? Was, you know, what? what's the situation there? And rather than give any information up, they're just completely silent. And the parents have just no idea where their poor daughter is. Yeah. It's so people are pissed. I mean, thousands of people all across the world are furious right now with how this has been handled, uh, furious with the family. But, but things really took a turn mm, in this mm. case on September 15th yeah. when body cam police footage was released from the Moab City Police Department. Like a full, what, hour 17 mm -hmm. of it? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah. Yeah. It's now got like 12 million views on, on YouTube, the full hour long encounter. And if you watch it and before we are going to play some clips of it, I just want to warn you guys, it is upsetting. It's upsetting to see Gabby in this state. It could be very triggering. So just giving you that warning. So it seemed like this day, August 12, 2021 was just not, not a good day for for Brian and Gabby, it seems like they were fighting throughout the day because, in fact, the incident between them started outside the Moonflower Co-op in Moab, Utah, where Brian and Gabby were actually seen fighting mm -hmm. and physically fighting, so much so that someone called 911 to report that a man was slapping a woman. So here's some of that audio. Hi, uh, I'm calling. I'm right on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower, and we're driving by, and I'd like to report a domestic dispute. Uh, we drove by and the gentleman was slapping the girl. He was slapping her? Yes, and then we stopped. They ran up and down the sidewalk. He proceeded to hit her, hopped in the car, and they drove off. All right, I will let somebody know. Thank you. Now, it's believed that this man is named Christopher, but now there has been some confusion that that might actually be the sec second witness call that just came out. We're not really sure. It doesn't really matter, I guess. It, but clearly, these witnesses want to remain on the low. So the second witness reported Brian and Gabby arguing over a phone. Brian was seen in the van, Gabby trying to climb through the driver's side window and was hitting him in the arm. So also that day, Officer Daniel Robbins was pursuing their van, which was driving 45 miles an hour in a 15 mile an hour zone. And he watched it cross a yellow line and then swerve into the curb before stopping. What's going on? How come you're crying? I'm just crying. We've just been fighting this morning. Some personal issues. 
It was a long day. We were camping yesterday and camping got supplies and stuff. Brian was driving and Gabby was crying in the passenger seat. And Gabby explains why she was crying. She instantly starts apologizing for Brian hitting the curb and took the blame for it. Brian apologized as well, but so did Gabby. She said, sorry, I distracted him. And the officer wrote in their report later that Gabby was crying uncontrollably the entire time. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I hit the the bump there. (laughs) I was distracting him from driving. I'm sorry. Then Gabby and Brian were separated so that they could each tell their versions of events to the officers separately. Can I get you to step out of the vehicle for me, man? Yeah. Just hang tight right there. Um, do you mind if I take your keys and just put them on your hood? You got it, buddy. I'm so Thank sorry. Thank you. Oh, no, you're fine. I'm going to go ahead and close your door. Okay. Why don't you come over here? Gabby blamed herself. She said that she had OCD and anxiety and had been apologizing to Brian for being in a bad mood that morning. And please note that OCD and anxiety do not cause violent behavior. But here's the clip. I have really bad OCD, and okay. I just—I was just cleaning and straightening up the back of the van before, and I was apologizing to him and saying, "I'm sorry that I'm so mean because sometimes I have OCD and sometimes I just get really frustrated. Not like mean towards him. I just like—I mean, guess my vibe is like I really I am like in a bad mood." I was just saying, I'm sorry if I'm in a bad mood. I've just been really stressed. I had so much work I was doing on my computer this morning. Then Gabby is kind of lectured by an officer about her anxiety. He started talking about his ex-wife, telling her that it's bad for your soul. Oh, that is the most irritating thing ever. It's really incredibly frustrating. Like, you don't even experience this. Mm Mm-mm. I hate when people are like, oh, I know someone with that. It's like, yeah. cool, what the fuck and does that even mean? it's destroyed them. It's like, yeah, because it's crippling and real. <laughs> but my ex-wife, this was my ex-wife, I'm just sharing, I know it's a little personal, but to help you understand, we would feed off each other's anxiety and spiral. You know what I mean? And it doesn't matter how much I loved her. It may be a bad for your soul. So she said that she was going through a lot of stress. She was trying to build her website and that Brian didn't think she could do it, which you know, it's obviously incredibly discouraging when your partner doesn't believe you can start your business or doesn't believe in you or your dreams. And I just got uh, my job to travel across the country and I'm trying to start a blog. And okay. just have a blog and stuff. So I've been building my website. So I've just been really stressed and he doesn't really believe that I could do any of it. So that's kind of been like a, I don't know, he's like, in, down there. I don't know, we've just been fighting all morning and... <laughs> And he wouldn't let me in the car before. And Why wouldn't he let you in the car? Because you have OCD? He told me I need to calm down. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm perfectly calm. I'm calm all the time. And he really stresses me out. And, I just, and this is a rough morning. Then Brian, later on when they were talking to him, he said that Gabby was trying to start her own little website blog. So belittling her. Yeah. Totally I mean, it seems that. very clear that Brian was not on board with sort of the vision that Gabby mm-hmm. had for their life and kind of what their career was going to be. It seems like Brian really wanted to just keep a low profile, didn't want to really mm-hmm, be a possibly. part of the whole social scene yeah, online per se. But it's interesting because the interaction with police and Brian is very different from mm-hmm. the interaction that they have with Gabby, which... Mm-hmm. It's pretty much police protocol for any sort of domestic uh, incident to separate uh, the two partners and you know talk to them separately because then you know you're, you're the idea is to sort of hear both of them out, get the story, and then try to paint you know try to take both of their testimonies and try to figure out exactly what happened, which is a very very tough job to do. And in this case, Brian, I mean, he had a totally different demeanor than Gabby. He was smiling, laughing, and actually joking around with the officers. Just very nonchalant, like mm-hmm. just being very apologetic and insisted he wasn't angry with Gabby. He was like, oh, you know, we're just camping and you know how it is. It's, you know, it's hard. And he just really downplayed his part in the fight. And he said he tried to put distance between him and Gabby and she got really loud. But she just gets worked up sometimes and I try and really distance myself from her. So like I, I lock the car and I walk away from her. You know, what happened this morning is that she's trying to start up like her own little website blog and everything. So I give her time. And I, we really had a nice morning, if anything, but um, 
she just got worked up because we were trying to get going and get our day going. At one point, Officer Robbins confirmed that he had pushed her to create some distance, obviously, and that's a quote. So he's basically saying Gabby's attacking him, and in order to try to calm the situation down and everything, he lightly pushed her in order to you know create some space. But again, keep in mind that both witness calls said that he was the one attacking her and slapping mm -hmm. her. In the I didn't get overtly physical. I was just trying to keep her away and not get hit. And then I got really loud and like that's probably your everyone's attention where I was going, you know, back up, get away, just give me a... Okay, okay so, so you I said you pushed her to create some distance, obviously, yeah. right? So apparently there was a recent update from Fox News that reported that officers were told that Brian was the aggressor in the August 12th incident. So dispatch clearly told the officers that he was hitting a female, a male was hitting a female. Mm -hmm. And so they knew that going into this and they were still like, you were saying treating him like, like they were like joking with him and kind of like mm -hmm. almost like growing it up in a way like, yeah, yeah man, I get you. And like, yeah. Crazy yeah, girl. Like said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Our crazy exactly. wives could be crazy. Right, exactly. Ha, ha, ha. Meanwhile, they, according to this, uh, according to Fox News, they knew that a male was hitting a female. RP states, seen a male hit a female domestic. He got into a white Ford Transit van, has a black ladder on the back, Florida plate. <laughs> Holy shit. Wow, that really changes my perspective on all of this. And I'm looking right now. Unless that wasn't conveyed well enough to them. I mean, what? It looks like Fox 13 published that um, clip on September 24th. So two days ago from when we're recording this. Wow. That is unreal. Oh, my God. That, yeah. Wow. So they literally just just got schmoozed by Brian, pretty much. Like, yeah. Brian, is, I mean, which says a lot about him. And, and I've already seen, you know, psychiatrists and stuff breaking down his behavior. Mm -hmm. And they're like, there's signs of narcissism there. I mean, there's, he's very manipulative. Like, he was able to basically fool them. Yeah, I, I mean, that, there's no other word for it. The fact that they didn't even check her for injuries no. is kind of crazy, considering that if they did indeed know that he was involved in a domestic earlier that day with mm -hmm. physical contact, I mean, you would you would think they'd absolutely be looking at her. And I mean, there's even a picture of her in the back of the patrol vehicle where there's clearly a mark there. I mean, it looks like light bruising on her arm where maybe he grabbed her arm or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um it's just crazy that they were like, oh, you know, let's look at your arms. I can see because just because he had some visible, you know, like hard to miss marks mm -hmm. on him that they immediately went to that Gabby's the aggressor here yeah. versus even checking her to see if he had done something to her because yeah. they had previous reports that he had. And this is such classic narcissistic abuse. Right. Like, mm -hmm. are you fucking kidding me? She's in distress. She's taking the blame. Yeah. I mean, it's just like to take that story when it's, I mean, over and over and over again, people who are in abusive relationships will lie to protect their partner yeah. out of fear uh -huh. of retaliation or losing them. You know, this is completely speculative, but it's possible, you know, when they were driving and they hit that curb that before they actually got pulled over and spoke with the officer, maybe Brian said to Gabby, you know, you better not tell them anything. You better not. Yeah, you could have straight I'm going to go to jail her. and you'll be alone. Yeah. I mean, who knows what could have been said. So, yeah, I really wish more time was taken to really analyze her. And this is why it would be so nice if every police department had a team that is special that trains in psychology and domestic violence that can come out and analyze yeah. behavior because it's their job. You know, right. at the end of the day, the police are not trained to deal with mental health crisis. And it's a real shame that. We don't have some type of team, like you said, that mm -hmm. can be deployed along with police so that police can do the job of what the police are mm -hmm. trained to do. And then someone who is a professional in mental health crisis can deal with this. Yes. Because they mm -hmm. don't know how to deal with this. No. They're, they haven't been trained for this. No. One of the things that I don't get is that the story that Brian is telling them and the story that Gabby's telling them are, are different. Mm -hmm. Brian's saying that he hit the curb you know, when he was being pulled over because Gra Gabby grabbed the wheel. But when the officer went and asked Gabby that, she denied that. She said no. So right there. And here's a clip of that. Quick question. You said you were hitting him in the arm. Did you grab the steering wheel? No, I didn't. You did not touch, touch the didn't steering wheel? I did steering wheel, but only, only, only for like a second because I just saw the lights come on and it was more just like, you're an idiot. Like, 
But did you grab the steering wheel and like no. swerve or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Okay. Didn't touch the steering wheel at all. <laughs> so right there, that should have been the little signal they needed to that something isn't right here. We need to investigate this further mm -hmm. and take this a step further and really figure out if Brian is telling us the truth because they're just kind of taking Brian's word for everything. Yeah. And uh, my thoughts too are like, get a female officer here so mm -hmm. that, you know, a female officer can, can look over Gabby more closely and a national park service ranger shows up, which the national park service ranger versus a police officer. You know, there's obviously she's a law enforcement officer, but does she have that experience dealing with mm -hmm. domestics in a national park area? Probably not as much as an officer would, but she, right away noticed that Gabby was anxious. You her know, name is Melissa. Something Holtz. was mm -hmm. off Just with clarify. her and that there was definite, definite signs of a toxic relationship there. Mm -hmm. She even encouraged Gabby to rethink her relationship, which is like not super helpful in this situation where there's physical assault happening. I yeah. mean, it just seems like they kind of brushed it off because Brian seems so like opposite of Gabby that like Brian immediately was able to cool him, like cool himself down. I mean, it really seems like the guy is, you know, he's two faced, like he can be really angry and then be really, really calm and, and collected, mm -hmm. especially in this type of stressful situation. So like we said earlier, the male officers were kind of relating to Brian, broing it up about stories of their own wives and ex wives. Here's some footage of that. And I know how rough this stuff can be. Like I said, I've been married for five and a half years. <laughs> you know, Believe me, if I were to say that me and my wife haven't had our share of spouts, I'd be lying to you. She lives with anxiety. I live with a woman no, both of are really, you know, I know. I, her anxiety elevates my yours. anxiety. And sometimes it that's just... Why I just that's why I'm like, I gotta, just, I gotta walk away, I gotta breathe, just, and put in a back of fire, even then. You know, but, I'm not gonna try and sit here and give you life. No, life no, advice. Yeah, You've yeah. been on this road for <laughs> almost as long as what I have. There's nothing I can tell you that's gonna really make a difference, but... At the end of the day, I'm sorry that this has happened. I'm sorry that it went to this. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One of the officers even asked if Gabby took any medications, and Brian said she's crazy. As a joke, apparently. Funny joke, dude. Yeah, do you know if she takes I'm, any? She's, she's just crazy. <laughs> no, um, no, I don't think so. No, none that I know of. Well, I think he's also using the fact that she's having a clear... Mm -hmm. mental breakdown and reaction to this that he's like oh well i can act totally cool like yeah. i'm just chilling here I, but and she's that unstable. makes her look even quote crazier yeah, yeah she's the one that's having the fucking breakdown i'm just here trying to yeah. you know i'm just trying to clear di have some distance so we can cool mm -hmm. off and you know take a break and yeah she doesn't have to be so upset and crazy and he's like i don't want to press charges neither of us want to press charges that's not what we want we love each other and they're both saying things like that mm -hmm. so let's go over brian's version of events so i kind of already talked about this a little bit about the fact that you know they were just kind of stressed out or gabby was stressed out from the flies in the area from camping and Brian's dirty feet, you know, just just a lot of like little things like that. Um, he also said that they had been at the coffee shop that day from nine till three. The van was dirty. He moved some food around, which stressed Gabby out more that day. At one point, an officer tried to get him water, but he said no because he doesn't like plastic water bottles. Any water? That's okay. It's hot out here. I was right? out, we were going to get water because it ran out. But it's okay. Some this. No, it's okay. I don't like plastic bottles. It's okay. Thank you. Though. Um, okay. But we just had a little disagreement there. And this disagreement was just that she was getting a little worked up, and I was saying, no, it's okay. Thank you so much. As long as it's cold, that's good. <laughs> um, so it, just, it was just more of a disagreement, and I just wanted to say. What was the this. disagreement about? It was, it was, I wouldn't even call it disagreement. It was just that I, I'm dirty, and I can't change being dirty. Like, I got dirty feet, I got sand in my foot pops, and stuff like that. Um, it was that we were at the coffee shop for so long, because we were there from nine to. So yeah, there's a few little little things, little just little relationships. I don't know if you're in a relationship with him. Um, he said he kept the keys to the van because he didn't want her to go anywhere, even though Gabby owned the van. So officers assumed he was justified in locking her out, which doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah, I'm like, what? Because Gabby was like, yeah, he locked me out of the van. Like it seems like he did that a lot, like just to be mean. During the whole encounter, Brian stayed polite and cooperative. He said he loved Gabby and didn't want to press charges against her. Mm -hmm. 
And there was a long stretch of small talk between Brian and an officer about their road trip, which was super casual and friendly. One officer on the scene announced that he had just got off the phone with one of the two witnesses, actually. So this particular witness who saw Brian try to lock Gabby out of the van said he never saw the male strike the female. That he never saw the male strike the female. He saw the male trying to lock her out of the vehicle. She even told us that he was trying to lock her out, told her to go take a walk, so that she was trying to get in. She eventually couldn't get in and actually clawed her way in through the driver's door. He says, I don't understand why she's doing that. Well, I think it's because it was the only door that wasn't locked that she could get through. She's trying to get in over him. He's trying to disengage from her. I guess he hung her backpack on the back probably so she'd have her shit so that he didn't have to engage with her. But then dispatch, you have it clearly mm -hmm. saying like... Well, yeah. there were Did, multiple calls that right. came in. But, yeah. So I'm saying even if one, even if the word mm -hmm. male striking female or someone striking someone is mm -hmm. being blurted out, then you need to take that into consideration. And go figure it out yourself. Yeah. Like I said, there should have been a, a much deeper investigation into yeah. this whole situation. That I think everyone that's seen this now and knows what we know now can agree. Yeah. So the officers, after hearing sort of both versions, they get together and they basically decide that Gabby was the primary aggressor in this situation. Everything she's saying is the same thing. I haven't heard what he said, but if that's what he said, it's also what the witness is saying. The witness says, I never saw him hit her. I saw him shove her, but I couldn't tell if it was an aggression against her or a defense against her as far as her, you know, being the aggressor. So at this point, from what, unless the guy's screaming that he needs to go to jail and did something to this girl, it sounds to me like she is the primary aggressor. So Brian was declared the victim. And the officer told Brian that they hadn't talked to the second witness yet, but he assumed that he'll say the same thing, which was not true. And both an independent witness, probably the next one we're going to talk to as well, which we haven't talked to yet, but one, the ones we did talk to, and your own companion have made it clear that she was the primary aggressor and that she was striking you and you just received injuries. You haven't admitted to striking her. She has not admitted to striking her. The witness did not see you strike her. So at this point, you're the victim of the domestic assault. That even <laughs> Officers told Brian that they had to separate him and Gabby for the night. They had no choice. They had to do something, especially if no one was going to go to jail. So they did a no contact order, which was already in place. And a no, this no contact order restricted Gabby, not Brian. If he talked to her and she responded, she would be charged with violating the order. Brian actually asked if he could go to jail for Gabby. And you can hear Officer Robbins saying, you did nothing wrong. So she's kind of in a tough spot. So unless you have an idea about how she could not go to jail and be separated, you have friends in town, somewhere she could stay. Tomorrow, if you want to, it's up to you. you can, can I go to jail? You can't because you don't have a charge for you. Now tomorrow, you nothing wrong. Yeah. Brian joked that he could take the officer's radio and then laughed that none of the officers acknowledged this joke or react at all. An officer suggested that Gabby go stay in a hotel and that Brian could keep the van. But after some discussion, they decided that Gabby would take the van and Brian would be put up for free in a hotel under a program for victims of domestic violence. You want me to, I'll call CK then. See if CK will take you for the night. I'll, I'll see if they'll, if they'll take you or one of them. CK even, figure it out for this is the CK even take me? Oh. Uh, yeah, actually, <laughs> actually, CK will take yeah. him as a victim of this assault. CK will take him, and they'll yeah. help you tomorrow. And you're like a block and a half away from the beekeeper. Let's see if okay. CK will take him because they took, they actually put up, actually, they didn't take a guy, but they got a hotel for a guy last time. Yeah, I'll do that. CK we might get you a hotel. Okay. Now, what she does. I'm, I'm happy sleeping outside in a sleeping bag. No, no, no. Like, I don't know. We're talking about this. I think CK, I'm just saying, uh, I think CK will get you a hotel. If he was going to do this, it required him to take pictures of his injuries to document them. Officer Robbins did ask if Gabby could take the hotel room, but since she was the aggressor, he was told no. Brian could waive the no contact order the next day at the police station, and Brian had told officers that he didn't have a phone. So if Gabby left in the van, he'd be stranded. And my big fear is, I don't have my phone, I don't really, I don't have a phone. So if she goes off without me, then car ride. Right. I'm on my own. <laughs> but later, Officer Robbins asked for his phone number, and Brian pulls out a phone. Now, maybe this phone didn't have data or Wi-Fi capabilities, and that's what he meant, but no one really questioned this. Now, at first, there was a lot of questioning over, you know, why he was able to just bring this phone out. Was he lying to police about having a phone, or was this Gabby's phone? But there is, off there is footage now that um, Gabby had her cell phone on her lap when officers went to get 
her phone number. And she was talking to her mom at one point. Yeah. In the car. Yeah. Just whether or not, you know, it was, yeah. it was he was holding onto hers. But clearly they both had yeah. phones and he just tried to lie to them saying he didn't have one. Of course he had a phone. He's yeah. on Instagram. Are yeah. you kidding me? Like, come so on. stupid. Yeah. Because there was a lot of speculation online that they were sharing a phone, but this is but not like, true. I don't know. Even if you're like this outdoorsy dude, if, whatever, it doesn't matter. But I just thought that was ridiculous how he's trying to lie about that. I know, seriously. Well, it tells you a lot about him. Right, that's what I'm saying. So Gabby told Officer Roberts to make sure that Brian has a phone charger and an officer told her to make sure that she keeps her cell phone on. So I've got him a hotel room tonight. So here in just a minute, I have to keep you guys separated. For right now, don't contact each other. Don't wave at him. Okay. Do you want me to say anything to him? Because I can do that for you. Do you want me to let him know that you love him and that you'll see him tomorrow and stuff like that? I can do that for you. Oh, he's bad about that too? Yeah. Okay, I'll make sure that he has a phone charger. Okay? And if I have anything else, please keep your cell phone on so I can call you if I have any questions. All right? And during all of this, Gabby was talking to her parents. An officer interrupted her call and firmly asked her if she was trying to harm Brian and why she was hitting him. And they said that how she answered this was incredibly important. Right. Very, very important question. How you answer this question is going to determine what happens next. But the only person who can answer this question is you. Mm -hmm. Think very hard before you answer the question. Do not quickly answer it. Think very hard. When you slapped him those times, were you attempting to cause him physical pain or physical impairment? Was that what you were attempting to do to him? No. What were, no. You, what were you attempting to do? What was the reason behind the slapping and stuff? I was trying to get him to stop telling me to come in. Well, it doesn't sound to me like she attempted to injure him. It's your call. This is 100% your call. I support you either way. I'll let you get back to your parents, okay? <laughs> Gabby ended up not being cited for domestic violence or charged. It's not clear if she still had an online court date and Brian and her had to separate for the night. I've decided I am not going to cite you for domestic violence battery, okay? It was only going to be a mm -hmm. class B misdemeanor. However, the domestic violence portion of it enhances it makes life a major pain in the butt, especially at your 22, right? So I'm choosing not to cite you today. So you are not going to be charged with it. All right? But this is what I do have to do. I am separating between you tonight. Okay? I want you guys both to be tonight away from each other. Relax. Breathe. Crying. Because there's no reason to be crying now. Okay? This is... I understand that this can feel like it's a nightmare, but you're coming out as the golden flower on top of it, okay? So, you're gonna be taking the van tonight, and you're gonna go somewhere else. I am going to get him lined up for the hotel room tonight. I want you guys to stay away from each other, for both of you guys the same. Gabby was still crying, shaking, and upset. Officer Robbins told her there was no reason to be upset now. She was coming out on top, basically. That's so, like, obnoxious. Why would you tell someone they have no, no reason, reason to be, be upset? upset now? Oh, your relationship's in, in shambles. She could be in an abusive relationship, but she has no reason to be upset. All right. Dude. Again, lack of training. Yeah. Like, right. I, to them, I think they're genuinely, like, trying to help. Like, mm -hmm. don't worry, girl. It's all, like, yeah. you're, you're not in trouble. Yep. You're right. So the report later said that she was in a confused mental state. The incident was characterized as a mental health crisis, but they still let her leave alone. Gabby said she usually didn't drive the van even. Here's that. I'm giving him a ride over to the hotel. Okay. So everything's going to be okay. Will it be a far drive for me to get him in the morning? I'm, I'm just curious. I'm not going to tell you where he's going to be at I, tonight. I know. Like I said, I... I want you guys to be separated, I, but I, I can just, tell you this. I just don't usually drive the van, so I just want to make sure it's not like far. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, uh, okay. it, it's basically from here to Moonflower. Okay. Okay. It's not far at all. So 
Let's get you in the van. Let's get you on your way. All righty. But she was sent off to camp alone in the van overnight by herself, which is potentially dangerous in itself, of course. And still crying, sniffling, and clutching her belongings, she was led to the van and allowed to just drive away from the scene. Meanwhile, Brian was chatting up with an officer who fist bumped him before he left. I could throw up. Me too. Officer Robbins ended up driving Brian to the hotel, and apparently they chatted and laughed during their drive. Officer Robbins walked him inside the hotel, shook his hand, and said it was nice to meet him, and Brian was still smiling widely. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. For, for everything. No problem. It's nice to meet you, Brian. Nice to meet you. Have a good one. Brian had a warm bed, a shower, a TV, while Gabby was left alone in the van, knowing that she had just been labeled as the aggressor in a situation where Brian had also been the aggressor. Because, I mean, you could say that both were aggressors in the situation. They both made physical contact with each other. But clearly, you could say that. You could, I, saying I'm that, saying you yeah. could say that, you know, that yeah. because they both made physical contact with each other. Clearly, Brian had mm -hmm. marks there, but... And of course, males and females can both be the aggressor. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's just crazy that no regard was given to any of the incidents that happened earlier mm -hmm. that day mm -hmm. where Brian had been seen by multiple witnesses slapping her, hitting her. So I don't know. It's just a complete, I don't know, complete breakdown of police investigating a domestic dispute, I feel like. Mm -hmm. On August 13th, this was Brian's last Instagram post the day after this whole incident happened. It was two separate posts, each with a series of pictures. The first post was tagged from Arches National Park, talking about biodegradable packaging versus plastic water bottles. The second post was tagged in Moab with a long rant about the relation of human beings to the planet and other living things. I thought this one, the first one you mentioned, talking about biodegradable packaging was so odd. He took like, what, five or six photos with a half of a cantaloupe? Like he's that proud of himself. It's like he set it up, stood in the background, tried to get all these artistic shots with the cantaloupe. It's so strange. Because he believed that's like all you need to survive, right? It was melons. Like, <laughs> well, he was saying that it's he likes fruit because it's you know you it's got water waste. In it. There's no, no waste. <laughs> no, because there's no waste, babe. Like but, you can just throw away your the bowl. Like there's no bowl. Yeah, it's just a Ryan. But he's clearly very proud of himself about this decision in the melon. It's just weird. Like one picture would have been enough, you know? Look at this. He keeps going on and on. And there, look, go to the last one. Look at that. How weird. The melon's like down. And he's like taking this artistic shot above it. Sorry, I can't, laugh. I can't help but laugh how stupid. It's so <laughs> stupid. So he yeah. believes he's like super, super environmental, environmentally friendly. Yeah. Because he. Yeah. Because then look this. at the next post. So if you're listening, the pictures of him on this giant rock standing by a tree and it's a huge quote but one of the parts says i think our culture our society has put itself above all living creatures creating needs purely to support destructive economic practices this tree doesn't require an apple watch it doesn't stream its favorite shows or have a microwave oven pay health insurance or drink grande ice caramel macchiatos it's just a tree but you rarely see geese riding jet skis or wearing designer clothing either geese that was so random yeah so weird I think if we all want breathable air and drinkable water, we all need to learn how to live with less. Yeah. Very, okay. Very yes to the message. I totally get what he's trying to say, but it does come across as very angry. Like he's got anger at the human race or anger inside. Like he doesn't say it in a way that makes you want to get on board with him. It's very uh, luxury. Well, it's very like to most people. I'm better than you. Yes, exactly. That's what I meant. So in those two posts, Gabby's not featured in the pictures and she's not tagged in them either. Like we said, her last posts were August 19th and 25th and no locations were tagged on either post. The August 19th post, the terrain outside the van doesn't look like the last tagged location in Arches National Park. And on August 25th, Gabby's hair is also shorter and lighter. Plus, she's not dressed for hiking. Also, comments on Gabby's Instagram are now set to limited. And more recently, a witness came forward about a fight at Mary Piglet's, which is a restaurant in Jackson, and that happened on August 27th. And the restaurant even confirmed this on their Instagram, that they were there. So according to the witness, who's named Nina Angelo, she and her boyfriend saw a commotion involving Gabby and Brian. They also called it a full-blown incident. 
Brian's body language, they said, was aggressive. He said he may have been arguing one of, with one of the restaurant's female employees about a bill or money. He walked out several times and may have been possibly getting kicked out. We're not completely sure on that at this point. Gabby left crying and seemed kind of embarrassed. And then she walked back in once to try to get Brian to leave. Nina was freaked out by Brian's behavior. And in her words, she said, they left abruptly. And Gabby was standing on the sidewalk crying. And Brian walked back in and was like screaming at the hostess and then walked back out. And then he walked back in like four more times to talk to the manager and to tell the hostess off. Wow. So this was a huge blow up then. Yep. Mm -hmm. And it's 100% confirmed to have happened on August 27th. Mm -hmm. So there was the Mexican restaurant or I I don't know if that's I keep hearing Mexican restaurant. Is that Mexican food? Um, Yeah. Mountain Tex-Mex. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the Mexican restaurant and then the Moonflower Co-op. And they were seen by multiple witnesses now. And there could be more witnesses that have come forward to police that we just don't know about yet. Mm -hmm. And Jackson is literally like 10 minutes from Grand Teton National Park. Mm -hmm. Um, So they probably were there just to grab a meal or something. And they were planning to, they were staying in Grand Teton National Park. So Gabby's mom, Nicole, had also later said that Brian and Gabby were not engaged anymore. This has been a confusing part because they were telling some people they were, but she insisted that Gabby had realized she was too young to get married, but they were still together. They both told officers on August 12th, however, that they were engaged. So September 14th, Gabby's stepdad, Jim, and a family friend went out to Wyoming to search Grand Teton National Park. On September 15th, Brian was officially named a person of interest. Obviously, this is very different from a suspect, and eventually he was named a suspect, but not in her murder yet. By September 15th, he was still not cooperating with officers. His attorney released a statement and advised his client not talk to investigators because now law enforcement tends to blame intimate partners in these types of cases. And all the while, the search for Gabby is continuing. So it seems like the 27th to the 1st, that's literally five days. Mm -hmm. And she's virtually last seen alive on the 27th. So I'm just trying to think when you know, Brian actually would have left. So it's, but it's, there's a potential that she may have, you know, gone missing on the 27th and Brian left Jackson around that time to make it back to Florida. I mean, yeah, that is true. We just don't know at this point. Those days are completely unclear. You know, who would know other than Brian, right? Mm -hmm. And Gabby, and we can't find out from her, unfortunately. So the case really started to go viral on the internet via TikTok um, once the body cam footage was released because it was just so shocking. I mean, it's really upsetting to see. And in TikTok fashion, a ton of misinformation comes out. Mm -hmm. So much. Like, oh, it's been draining to be on there the last couple of days. I've just been clicking not interested, not interested on account after account because, I mean, there's definitely people out there that want to help spread awareness and are just reporting things that are true, but just the amount of speculation or I heard this about the laundry family or I heard this about Brian or Brian went live on his Instagram account. Here's a video of it. That wouldn't, I remember showing that to you on TikTok. Like, what is this? Someone said he's live on his Instagram, like over the water and people just fake these accounts. It's unreal. And they also make like comedy trendy Yes. videos about it like you know how on tiktok oh if you're on God. tiktok Falling there's songs down the rabbit hole of the yeah. Brian and, and there's Gabby. like songs yeah. that are super you know viral right and you make yeah. little stupid tiktoks and people are doing that yep. to this case which is like yeah really like something. me going out as soon as i heard there was a reward for right. buying laundry Let's running out girls, there to go yeah. get it myself mm-hmm. <laughs> it's i don't understand how people don't understand why that's so wrong mm-hmm. like where is your conscience what what person has no sense enough to do that plus there's so many psychics out there and people who are using spirit boxes to try to communicate with her spirit oh my gosh i've seen some really disturbing clips it's just sad and all these different psychics are saying different things and obviously i mean i'm i am a person who believes that some people do have 
uh, that sense and they have those abilities. And of course, there have been cases where the FBI does work with psychics, but it's never done on a public platform right. for people's entertainment. They're yeah. brought in there. Yeah. They work with them. Seems like a attention you know? grab. Mm-hmm. Oh, of course it is. Of to course be like, oh, it yeah, is. I can communicate with her spirit and get the, the oh, real details. Imagine how why aren't you working for the be. FBI? Why don't you have a career? Why are you on TikTok <sighs> talking about this? Then like it's just like you're not helping at all. Of course, none of these people are donating anything. They're just, oh, and it's I like feel, just so sad. I feel like when it's so new at this point, like you really shouldn't be doing that unless the family's like asking for that. Right. Or if, like if they come out and they're well, like anyone who mm-hmm. is a psychic or claims to be like, please come out, you know, but they're not. Mm-hmm. I just feel like you need to not do anything that would make mm-hmm. potentially the family feel more terrible than they already do. Yes. And I mean, saying psychic predictions, it's bad, but it's a whole nother level to be con- connecting with her spirit on a public platform yeah. and putting on a TikTok clearly for entertainment. Mm-hmm. And let's just all hope that her family, that her poor siblings never fucking see that oh, because really how tough. scary. Yeah. I, mean, I hope they, I hope they're trying to stay off the internet as much as they can, but damn, I mean, people really don't, they think this is some lifetime movie. This is a real family. How dare you? Well, it's really sad too, because I was trying to, only imagine if I was in their shoes and people were posting stuff about my loved one. I feel like I would almost there'd be an itch to still like go watch. Cause I'm like, well, what are they saying about them? Even though yeah. I know it could like be damaging. Yeah, possibly. It's just so sad to be put in that place of. Mm-hmm. <sighs> well, know, I, I recently worked with a family, um, Fawn Mountain's family on a video on her case. And they talked to me about how just horrible a specific psychic was constantly putting out all these fake you know, ghost box readings with Fawn who was murdered and just how, how damaging and upsetting it's been to them. They've, they've asked them to stop several times. Eventually they stopped because I kind of yeah. lit a fire, but mm-hmm. you know, I mean, there's just so many out there. It's really bad. Yeah. And it's, it's like, seems like TikTok is a breeding ground for it. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. And it's not just this case. It's all yeah. things pretty mm-hmm. much like, uh, it's, it drives me insane. I hate mm-hmm. it. I do too. There was also a lot of speculation at one point, and there were several articles written about this as well. It's not just random people speculating, but there was a double homicide that happened right around the same time in the same area. Newlywed couple Kylan Schulte and or Schultz. I'm not sure if it's Schulte or Schultz. I'm pretty sure it's Schulte. I think it's Schulte and Crystal Turner. It actually just gotten married and um, they were camping and they were found dead on August 18th in Grand County, Utah. So for a while, people thought maybe Brian was the one that did it, but police have investigated and say that there is no connection. So we wanted to clarify that because I know that's been pretty confusing. And Kylan worked at the Moonflower Co-op. Right, so they so were like, that's oh, where people yeah. are connecting do they it. know yeah. or did they see if something happen? And yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we're going to take one more break and then we will get back into the case. Did you know that a simple finger prick can unlock tons of insight into your reproductive health? I'm talking egg count, menopause timing, if your hormone levels indicate conditions like thyroid disorders or PCOS, all the things that are good to know whether kids are in your future or not. That's why Modern Fertility was created. It's the easy and affordable way to test your fertility hormones at home with a simple finger prick. All you do is mail it in with a prepaid label and you'll get your personalized results within 10 days. Traditional testing with your doctor can cost over $1,000, but Modern Fertility gets you that same information for $159, a fraction of the price. And if you go to modernfertility.com slash mile higher, you get $20 off your test. Also, if you have HSA or FSA, you can put those dollars toward Modern Fertility as well. You'll get insight into your hormone levels, how many eggs you have, and other important fertility factors. And the results go deep into what every hormone means And you can also do a one-on-one talk with a fertility nurse to review your results and your options for next steps. If you want kids or maybe you want kids one day in the future, clinically sound info about your body can help you make the decision that's right for you. And right now, Modern Fertility is offering our listeners $20 off your test when you go to modernfertility.com slash mile higher. That means that your test will cost $139 instead of the several hundred or even a thousand plus dollars that it could cost at a doctor's office. So get $20 off your fertility test when you go to modernfertility.com slash mile higher. That's modernfertility.com slash mile higher. For many, many years, 
I never knew when it was time for a new toothbrush. I never even knew if I was brushing for the full dentist recommended two minutes. But since I've started using the Quip electronic toothbrush for like the past couple of years, my dental hygiene game has gone through the roof. Because Quip makes it super simple to keep your teeth clean and your mouth healthy with all of their amazing Quip products. I mean, you've probably heard us talk about Quip a million times, but this is something brand new that actually rewards you and your mouth that I'm gonna tell you about. The Quip Smart Brush for adults and kids connects to the Quip app with Bluetooth. You can track when and how well you brush, get tips and coaching to improve your habits, but best of all, you earn points for daily brushing and bonus points for completing challenges like streaks. Redeem for rewards like free products, gift cards, and discounts from Quip and partners. Already have a Quip, you can upgrade with a smart motor and keep the features you know and love. You get sensitive sonic vibrations, two-minute timer with 30-second pulses for a guided clean. It's slim, lightweight, and sleek with no wires or bulky charger to weigh you down. That's what I love about it is because a lot of electric toothbrushes have this like base and you have to plug it in. But when you travel... This is just the easiest way to take an electronic toothbrush with you. Plus, it has a multi-use travel cover that doubles as a mirror mount for even less clutter. Beyond the Brush Quip has everything you need to build a complete routine. Mint or watermelon toothpaste with anti-cavity ingredients, which are absolutely delicious. Some of my favorite toothpaste out there. The floss. I love the refillable floss. You know, it's good to floss your teeth every day. And Quip comes in clutch with their refillable dispenser to help reduce waste. And they got sugar-free gum. I mean, who doesn't love gum? with their one-click dispenser that delivers a long-lasting mint flavor and freshens your breath and can even help you prevent cavities. And they've got the refillable mouthwash that's good for you and the planet. In addition to brush heads, Quip also delivers fresh floss, toothpaste, mouthwash, and gum refills every three months from $5. Shipping is free so you can save money and skip the hustle and bustle of in-store shopping. So join over 5 million mouths who use Quip, including myself, and save hundreds compared to other Bluetooth toothbrushes. Start getting rewards for brushing your teeth today and go to getquip.com slash milehire10 right now to save $10 on a Quip Smart Electric Toothbrush. Start getting rewards for brushing your teeth today by going to getquip.com slash milehire10 and right now you'll save $10 on a Quip Smart Electric Toothbrush. That's $10 off a Smart Electric Toothbrush at getquip.com slash milehire10. G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash milehire10. Quip is the good habits company. So jumping right back in here on Friday night, September 17th, Brian's family contacted the FBI. Agents went out to their home, and that's when they told them that Brian was missing. They had no mention of Gabby. However, they did have their attorney on the phone the whole time listening to the conversation. I'm sure he told them not to say anything about Gabby. So then Brian becomes a missing person, and he can't be referred to as anything else because he's not, there's no evidence that he has a connection to this crime at this point. So Tuesday, September 14th, they claim that Brian left to go hiking at the Carlton Reserve. This is in Venice, Florida, about 13 miles from their home. And it's massive. 25,000 acres. Yeah. Huge. 75% of it's underwater. It's Mm -hmm. alligator infested. Mm -hmm. Seems like a kind of an odd choice to go hiking in the middle of heat of summer in florida i guess people do it but yeah well there's not many other options i mean it's hot and muggy everywhere just weird to you know come home without your loved one and then immediately go Mm -hmm. hiking well clearly he wasn't just going hiking i'm sure we can all agree right so that day his silver mustang was ticketed by police there was a note left on it to be moved or it would be towed However, they never ran the plates on the vehicle, which was another huge fuck up. Because they could have figured out that this is Brian Laundrie's vehicle. Mm -hmm. And started searching the Carlton Reserve right away. Wouldn't that have been nice? So his parents found the note, but they left the car there until Thursday. And then Thursday, September 16th, the car was brought back to their home. Agents talked to Chris and Roberta for more than two hours on Friday night. They announced the search for 23-year-old Brian Laundrie. And the official description of him was put out, which we'll say that now. He is 5'8", about 160 pounds, brown eyes, short brown hair, trimmed facial hair. And hair and facial hair can obviously be different by now. It's been quite some time, so he could have a beard or have his hair grown out. Obviously, if he's out there, he's going to try to change his identity as much as possible. But he does have distinctive tattoos on his right hand and on his finger. 
Brian was last seen wearing a hiking bag with a wrist strap. And at this point, he was still a person of interest, not considered a suspect. And this was a multiple missing persons case, not a criminal investigation, you know, officially. But right. most people had right. their thoughts at this point. And then early in the morning on Saturday, September 18th, that's when the search for Brian at the Carlton Reserve started. They brought out 50 officers from the Northport Police Department. The FBI was there as well as some other agency partners. And again, this is a massive, massive stretch of land. There's more than 80 miles of hiking trails, almost 25,000 acre reserve. And it's just super, super, I mean, it's a swamp. It's basically a swamp. There's tons of, of plants, trees, alligators, thick brush, muddy roads. So it's not an easy place to search by any stretch of the imagination. So they brought in tracking dogs, giant swamp buggies, which were kind of cool to watch go through this reserve. They just plow through everything. They can go through water and really provide the officers an efficient way to search through this vast area of land. They obviously had drones, they had helicopters. I mean, they brought in every possible resource possible to search for Brian. The reserve has 13 foot alligators. It has panthers, black bears, wild boar. It has several lethal species of snakes and also huge swarms of mosquitoes. So I mean, a place to go hiking for the day, sure, but a place to go and stay for a long period of time, I don't know. Well, it's possible he's out there. It is. I mean, several experts, even Dog the Bounty Hunter, which we'll get more into, said that he could be there. He could be. Any, but it, I mean, now it's unlikely because be, they've searched so much of it. And they found absolutely nothing. But I know, but it's it's that massive. Right. There could where, be an area the that brush hasn't. Is thick, so the infrared can't go all the way down. So they can't use that technology in all areas. He could be like right underneath the water during the day and then be moving during the night, sleeping upward. I don't know. He could he could be out there. I just want to yeah. make sure that's clear. I mean, all the locals though and people that live I know. near this are like, there's just no way. There's no way somebody's Most people surviving in general out there. Seem to think that. Yeah. It, Which is be, crazy because they've already spent a million dollars. Yeah, a week out there searching. Yeah. So it's like, you know, and that's a lot. I mean, mm-hmm. Like you said, I, I guess he could be like up in a tree sleeping during the day while they're searching and he's on the move at night. I mean, that's always a possibility, but I mean, it's it, it's tough, tough going out there for sure. But basically, they searched this day in, day out. And each night, the police report would basically say they found nothing of note. So many people question if Brian is actually there or was ever there in the first place. But police have come out and said that they had good intelligence that has led them to believe that he may be out there, hence mm-hmm. why they're searching so much. Yeah. Um, but the Carlton Reserve has had trail cameras set up since 2006, so maybe mm-hmm. police have evidence from those cameras. It's just not being released from the public. Yeah. Maybe he's walked past one of them, and that's their intelligence for why they're searching it so hard. But if, you know, and this is speculative, but of course, if he did park his car outside the reserve, there's no reason why he couldn't have walked through there, dropped some things, made some footprints, given them plenty to look for and do to think that he's in there and then had taken off even before his parents, you know, told anyone. Right, right. It's very possible. Now, this is interesting. So a friend of Gabby's, Rose Davis, actually spoke to the media and it's Gabby's only friend in Florida. And she claims that, you know, Brian is a survivalist who has lived in the Appalachians for about three months with no help. And we'll get into this even a little bit more here later on because, you know, now there's more and more people being involved in looking for him. And somebody very interesting believes that Brian, that might be in fact where Brian is, is in the Appalachian mountains. But she also claimed that Brian was jealous and controlling with Gabby. He came off as sweet and caring, but he was a little off and a little weird. Brian didn't want Gabby to have friends and was worried she would leave him. Rose said that Gabby and her shared their locations with each other through an app, and Brian actually made Gabby delete it. Wow. Damn. That's an That update. is so narcissistic Very contr- abuse. Yes. Like, oh yes. my God. To a it is T. textbook. <sighs> yeah. So sad. Gabby also allegedly told Rose that Brian had episodes where he couldn't sleep and he heard voices. Damn. That's scary. Her friends from New York didn't like Brian and were bullying her about being with him. Gabby sometimes stayed at Rose's house to get a break from Brian even, and one argument stemmed from Brian stealing Gabby's ID to keep her from going out. Of course, like any relationship, there was arguments, and she 
come stay at my house when there was arguments just to like get away from it, you know, and I didn't ask most questions because if she wanted to tell me, she could tell me, you know. Well, we were supposed to go line dancing. It was ladies night and her drive is about 30 minutes to me and halfway there she realized her uh, ID was missing and so it caused a really big argument because Brian just didn't want her to go out and it was a jealousy issue and um, it caused a huge argument between them and she came over and cried and just talked to me about what happened and told me all that she was comfortable telling me. Rose said that she last spoke to Gabby in early August and planned to meet her in Yellowstone in September. So the search continued through September 22nd. A team of 10 divers from the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office were requested for a dive operation in Carlton Reserve. The Sheriff's Underwater Recovery Force, or SURF, is made up of highly trained water specialists, and they're called to search for evidence of crimes in water. Authorities also brought in pumps to search the water because they were looking for anything, both Brian or some trace of him, like his backpack. On September 23rd, there was a media report about some witnesses that came forward, and it was actually neighbors of the laundries, William and Charlene Guthrie. And during the first week of September, they noticed that the laundry family had a new camper attachment for their pickup truck, and they actually had packed up the camper and left, and Charlene said that they were gone for the weekend. According to media reports, the family left on September 11th after learning Gabby was reported missing. And these witnesses said that they have also talked to law enforcement about this information. The Laundry family's attorney, Stephen Bertolino, said when Brian left on Tuesday, September 14th, he didn't have his wallet or phone. Allegedly, he brought no money, credit cards, or ID. So his parents were concerned Brian might hurt himself. So we don't really know whether or not Brian actually left with his wallet or phone or if he left that behind. We just have to go off base basically what the Laundry family's attorney is saying. But it's quite possible that the police do have his phone potentially which probably not i mean mm. most people take their phone with them but maybe he left his phone and wallet and everything behind because he didn't want i mean you can trace people with a phone so maybe he did leave it maybe the police do have it and they're using that to look for him meanwhile up in the grand teton national park the search for gabby is ongoing the fbi the national park service the teton county sheriff's office as well as the jackson wyoming police were all doing surveys uh, of the ground around the Spread Creek dispersed camping area. And Brian and Gabby were believed to be there August 27th through the 30th. Authorities requested help from the public and anyone who had been there during those dates were asked to come forward or you know, just anyone who may have seen Gabby, Brian, or their white van. And it sounds like they actually sent out some type of alert through people's phones Yeah, yeah. to search any photos they had if they were in the area. Like an emergency yeah. message, yeah. And that really helped. Because multiple people claim that they saw a young woman matching Gabby's description hitchhiking near the Tetons on August 12th or August 13th. But again, these are rumors and, you know, it kind of leads police and authorities down some wild goose chases sometimes. There were photos taken in the Tetons, which allegedly showed Gabby asleep or dead in the background, which I think you showed me. Yeah, that, that was like that the was first just, day that started to go viral. The second day it was yeah. so stupid. It matched her outfit from a previous picture. Um, it was a photoshopped picture. Yeah, it I went viral on Reddit. Believing that, I was like, yeah, it's really sad. Can you imagine wasting your time photoshopping a photo like yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, really, it's like true evil. On September 18th, the media reported that police had talked to a woman who claimed she had picked up Brian. Mm -hmm. On August 29th, Miranda Baker and her boyfriend saw Brian hitchhiking near Grand Teton National Park and they picked him up around 5.30 p.m. She did offer all this information to the police. They, you know, will have checked into everything, but she was allowed to post this on TikTok as well to raise awareness for other people that could have picked him up since he hitchhiked with multiple people. Now let's go ahead and just play her clip so you can hear it right from her. Hi, my name is Miranda Baker, and on August 29th, my boyfriend and I picked up Brian at Grand Teton National Park at 5 30 at night at Coulter Bay. He approached us asking us for a ride because he needed to go to Jackson, which we were going to Jackson that night. So I said, you know, hop in. Um, he hopped in the back of my Jeep. He then told us he's been camping for multiple days without his fiance. He did say he had a fiance and that she was working on their social media page back at their van. 
in conversation I brought up, yep, like, we're going to Jackson, um, he freaked out, he's like, nope, I need to get out right now, um, you know, like, pull over, so we pulled over at the Jackson Dam, um, when he asked to ride, he has to go to Jackson, which, if you're familiar with the area, a lot of people call Jackson Hole, Jackson, so that's why I said yes to giving him a ride, but you think any good hiker would know south and north, we were going south out of the park when he said he was camping north he had told us that him and gabby were not camping on a regulated campsite through the national park that they were camping basically out in the middle of nowhere along snake river this is key information he said that he had hiked for days along snake river but when like looking at his backpack it wasn't full and he said all he had was a tarp to sleep on which you think if you're going camping for days on end, you'd want food and a tent, and he had none of that. And like I said, he looked clean and didn't smell bad. So this is a view of the whole the, um, journey with Brian. So that's the top at the park at Coulter Bay. And then we drove him to this dam right here. Then at the dam, we dropped him off at this little turno, and he said he was going to walk across the street to the parking lot, which was full of people, to continue hitchhiking. So it's really weird that he offered them $200 for this short ride. That's very strange. He mentioned that his fiance was back at their van, but never said Gabby's name. And they were camping together in a remote area along Snake River that he'd been hiking alone for days, but he was clean and carrying a small backpack and just a tarp to sleep on. Then um, this whole thing between Jackson and Jackson Hole, Miranda said in the TikTok, as you heard, that they were headed to Jackson Hole and suddenly he wanted out of the car. Which is going back mm -hmm. away from where he was trying to go, which was Jackson, Wyoming. Jackson's Hole's back where he would have been coming from, mm -hmm. from where Gabby was. Yeah. But like she mentions in her TikTok, yeah. you would think that as someone who's a quote, experienced hiker outdoorsman would understand what direction you're driving in and be like, oh wait, this is not where I'm supposed to be going. Yeah. Like it took for her to say that before he freaked out was like, oh, never mind. And she said that there was just panic about going that way mm -hmm. too. It was just like, stop immediately. I need to get a ride from someone else. And she dropped him off at 6.09. Miranda was hoping that someone else would see her video, maybe someone else who picked him up and interacted with him after she picked him up. And then on September 25th, Fox News reported another woman had picked up Brian on August 29th, Norma Jean Jalovec realized the hitchhiker she picked up was Brian after seeing Miranda's TikTok videos. She had picked him up around 6.15 or 6.20 p.m. near the location where Miranda had reportedly dropped him off at. He asked to be dropped off at the gate of the Spread Creek dispersed camping area around 6.30 or 6.40 p.m. Norma offered to drive him into the remote campground, which has a single dirt road extending for miles to reach the different campsites. But Brian actually tried to get out of the moving car and it just was insistent upon letting him out. And she also passes information along to the FBI. So then September 19th, YouTubers found footage of Gabby's van that was taken on their GoPro on August 27th, 2021, between 6 and 6.30 p.m. These guys, I guess, have a pretty much what Gabby was trying to do, a van life channel. They make these vlogs and she was actually sitting down to edit it when or she was already editing it and someone called her and said hey they're asking for information you could i think you guys were in the area at that time and she said actually i'm editing the vlog right now from august 27th so it's she crazy. starts going through it yeah. and she happens to see brian's van or gabby's van just parked along the side of the road and she said when they actually saw it at first she saw their license plate that they were from florida and she wanted to try to talk to them but the van seemed kind of closed off and no one was around. So they ended up just turning around and leaving the area. And what's crazy too, is, and the fact that this happened is, is honestly wild and maybe it's divine intervention or something. But she yeah. said that they had actually just finished filming like a clip of, of, you know, her husband or, or her boyfriend, you know, just talking to the camera about what, what they were doing. Her and, husband, yeah. And, you know, that once they were done, they normally like shut the GoPros off, but they had mm -hmm. forgotten to shut the GoPros off. So the GoPros were just running mm -hmm. and it was just like quiet as they were driving yeah. and they captured this footage. They just happened to be running 
as they drove by. You know, it's interesting you said um, divine intervention because when I watched an interview with her, um, the vlogger, she said that they had lost their son in a car accident before all of this happened. Oh, and wow. they believed that their son's spirit helped them to that's find a, this footage and to pass thought, it to yeah. police. And yeah. Yeah. Because this ended up being a huge tip. Huge tip. Yeah, and if you actually look at the footage a little bit closer, you can actually see that there is a sandal behind the van. Mm -hmm. could potentially be Gabby's or Brian's. But it does look like Gabby's sandal from the body cam footage. Also, people think that there possibly could be a cell phone on the ground near the sandal. This has not been confirmed yet. We're not sure exactly. I mean, the footage isn't completely perfect. Um, so there's also a strange figure in the field behind. It kind of looks like a person bending over. But enhanced footage shows that it's not a person. That's a new and that's a bit of new information. When I recorded my video, we didn't know at that point. A lot of people have also thought that they see a face in the van. This is also not confirmed. The van door was open and then closed on camera. That's all captured. And then September 19th, remains were found in this camping area that matched Gabby's description. Let's play the clip from the yeah. FBI making this announcement because I think it's really yeah. important to just understanding the gravity of, of all of this. And just notice his emotion. Yeah, It's pretty rare for in press conferences like this for them to get emotional. This is an incredibly difficult time for the family and friends. Our thoughts and prayers are with them. We ask that you all respect the privacy as they mourn the loss of their daughter. As you are aware, FBI personnel, in coordination with our partners at National Park Service, the Forest Service, Teton County Sheriff's Office, and Jackson Police Department, have been conducting an investigative activity in the vicinity of the Spread Creek um, dispersed camping area. Earlier today, human remains were discovered, consistent with the description of Gabrielle Gabby Petito. Full forensic identification has not been completed to confirm 100% that we found Gabby, but her family has been notified of this discovery. The cause of death has not been determined at this time. We appreciate your continued support and patience as we work through this process. So the next day after the news that Gabby's remains or remains consistent with Gabby's description were recovered, on September 20th, a search warrant was executed for the laundry home. It was also called a crime scene, and Roberta and Chris Laundry were escorted by FBI agents into an unmarked vehicle. The warrant allowed removal of electronic devices and photos, and Brian's silver Mustang was also seized at this time. Don't you think it's very strange that this guy's like an environmentalist, minimalist, but he drives a Mustang? A little bit. Yeah. I think it's really odd. Yeah, you would expect him to drive something, Doesn't a seem hybrid like vehicle or choice. electric vehicle or something. It could have just been passed down to him, yeah. maybe all he had, but right. still, I just thought that was odd. And we don't know what they were hoping to find, but we know that this was an extensive search. 25 FBI agents, many of them in tactical gear when they went inside the home. We know they searched the camper right here. They searched inside the house. They were in the back in a shed, really not leaving any stone unturned, but still right now, no sign of Gabby's fiance. Brian Laundry. As a result of the search warrant, they actually recovered a computer found in Gabby's van. And from this information, they were able to verify through text between Gabby and Nicole that, in fact, Brian and Gabby were fighting. And there was a message on August 27th from Gabby's phone that said, Can you help Stan? I just keep getting his voicemails and missed calls. And Stan was her grandfather. And this was actually a very weird text to get from Gabby and really worried Nicole. She always called him grandpa or gra grandfather. Right. She wouldn't just say, say Stan. Stan, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, seems like someone else. Hmm. So Tuesday, September 21st, the laundry family attorney scheduled a press conference, but then he abruptly canceled it after talking to the FBI, but he denied that the FBI made him cancel it. We still don't know why. Probably because the FBI was like, this just got a whole lot more serious yeah. and... He was probably like, okay, we're just going to shut our mouths and Maybe. we're not going to say anything. Maybe. I mean, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know I'm why. just speculating. Yeah, yeah. You know, we don't know. But yeah, it's possible he's concerned about his own involvement in all of this. But right. yeah, it's just too early to say. So Tuesday uh, evening, September 21st, the FBI confirmed that the remains that were found were Gabby Petito, even though they pretty much confirmed that before. 
but now it was official. And they also announced that this was a homicide. The full autopsy results will be released later on. It's still too early. And it's being conducted by the Teton County Coroner, Dr. Brent Blue. We still have no cause of death, but the manner of death is definitely homicide. So this is interesting to me that, you know, they're saying there's, we don't know the cause of death, but the manner of death is definitely homicide. So they're willing to say homicide. So I I just thought when I heard, you know, remains were found that were consistent with the description, Mm -hmm. you know, and this is, this is pretty grim to, to even think about, but it just, it, it makes me think that her, her body was recovered in, you know, not, yeah. Not a good condition. I think we can all agree that that's what they meant. And you so, know. and also they need to do further investigation to figure out the cause of death. The fact that they came forward the day that the autopsy was being done and said that this was a homicide tells you that it was an obvious homicide. Right. You know, if this is strangulation, if this is drowning, it's going to take a little bit more to confirm that. It seems like they were able to tell just by looking at her. Right. Uh, which, of course, we don't know at all what her cause of death actually is it could be blood force trauma could have been a gun involved we just don't know at this point but once we find out that information it's going to tell us a lot it's really sad to think about though because your mind just goes all over thinking of all the things that could have happened and yeah it freaks me out that they say remains but i don't know if that's just right i don't know if that's just terminology and they wouldn't say a body was recovered versus remains remains to me indicates multiple i know i know yeah yeah So Wednesday, September 22nd, a federal arrest warrant was issued for Brian Christopher Laundrie, and this was issued by the U.S. District Court of Wyoming, and it's an indictment for the use of unauthorized access devices after Gabby's death. So basically bank fraud. Um, So that's the only thing that he is listed as an official suspect in is a bank fraud case. So this is the largest manhunt in history for over a technically over a bank for allegedly using case. a capital one bank debit card and a pin for two capital one bank accounts mm-hmm. uh after for items worth mm-hmm. about a thousand bucks yeah on each one uh so and that was between august 30th and september 1st which i think i mean after the autopsy result i think this is just the fbi you know uh, it's the legal way to basically turn this into a manhunt from just looking for a missing person. Yeah, they, yeah. they use this. They knew that this yes. happened because they FBI has the ability to look into mm-hmm. the bank records and all that. And so they're able to be like, OK, here here's the piece of evidence we need to actually turn him into a fugitive mm-hmm. and kind of step everything up. Yep. So September 23rd, Buhoff Law, which is a Northport law firm, offered up $20,000 for any info leading to Brian's exact whereabouts. It has to be a tip that actually leads to him being found and has to be, you know, proven back to them. And then they will give that out. I mean, hopefully that that drives a lot of incentive all over the world. The city of Moab also released a statement saying they're investigating how the officers responded to the incident on August 12th. And they're currently not aware of a breach of police department policies. Which, yeah. And I mean, people argue that the mm-hmm. officers didn't really didn't do anything wrong, which Ooh. I don't think they necessarily did anything wrong from like a technical standpoint. But as far as just not investigating things as thoroughly as they should have, which mm-hmm. is, you know, up to interpretation, I think that's I, I think that's the most frustrating thing is we just people feel like they didn't, you know, go as deep into this yeah. or they look into as much. Rushed with the dispatch set under the rug. Right. About yeah. him hitting her. So I yeah, mean, I feel like that is technical. That is. And they focused on Brian's injuries, ignored Gabby's, even though she described how he grabbed her face. They empathized with Brian, related to him, even joked around. That is sickening. At least one of the officers was intimidating towards Gabby and interrogating her about why she was hitting Brian. Officers did not talk to the second witness who made the 911 call before deciding that Brian was the victim and that Gabby was the aggressor. One officer also made multiple excuses for Brian He assumed that he had lied about Gabby grabbing his wheel in order to protect her. He said that he was justified in locking Gabby out of her own van. Officers also asked Brian if Gabby could drive the van. And even though he was going 30 miles an hour over the speed limit again, it was her van. Yeah. And I'm I'm just looking because like obviously per state, there's different laws around domestic violence uh, and how police 
deal with it. But from what I'm seeing, I guess technically just based on the witness statements of Brian hitting her mm-hmm. and it was consistent with his Dispatch description call. that they could have probably made an arrest on Brian at this mm-hmm. point as well. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, they, they clearly just didn't, didn't take this as seriously as they should have. And it's super unfortunate that, you know, they didn't at least, you know, even arrested Gabby or, or you know, somebody in this incident, it's, which really would have separated them and potentially saved her life. Yeah. Oh, it's absolutely true. Okay, so let's talk about the most recent updates as of the last uh, two days before we are recording this. It seems that officers involved could likely face disciplinary action. And also the owner of the hotel where Brian was given a free room could not confirm that he ever even checked in. There was no surveillance footage of him even on the property. So there's been a huge spotlight on his parents, obviously, Chris and Roberta Laundry. They're now being referred to by many as the dirty laundries. There has been no legal obligation to tell the police where Brian is, obviously. And Florida law doesn't allow parents to be charged as accessories after the fact in some crimes. Mm -hmm. They could be charged if Brian is charged with first or second degree felony, but not if he's charged with a third degree felony. But also there are no parental protections if they covered up a crime or made a misleading statement to police. So if police find out that they're lying to them about yes not having contact with Brian or yep. you know knowing where Brian is currently and that turns out you know they find mm-hmm. concrete evidence they can be charged yep. covering it up not reporting it is a federal crime. So September 25th, Dog the Bounty Hunter, Dwayne Chapman got involved. He was spotted outside of the laundry home. This went pretty viral on the internet yesterday and there's been a lot of kind of joking about it. Just because he's a reality TV show star, he has a show. I'm not sure what it's called. Do you guys know? Dog the Bounty Hunter. Dog. Oh, do- that makes sense, right? Dog <laughs> yep. the Bounty Hunter. On AD. Um, he has claimed that he has captured over 8,000 people. You know, as much of a joke as it seems to be to some people that it's kind of like, oh, dog, the Bounty Hunter's on the scene. This is becoming ridiculous. I've seen so many comments like that. But this is, a, this is really good. He's very good at what he does. He also claims that he has never had to use a real gun to apprehend fugitives. Instead, he uses non-lethal pepperball guns, similar to a paintball gun, which is loaded with some type of marble. Yeah, it's like a less than lethal gun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So most of his inspiration, he says, comes from the loss of his daughter, who was around Gabby's age in a car accident in 2006. And he really wants to help because he said he knows the pain of losing your child. And he lost his wife in the last, like, couple years i think to cancer too it's terrible so i I think he's just trying to honestly to help and and he's just being a good person jumping in and offering up his you know his service and and expertise i mean he does i mean eight thousand fugitives who how many people Mm -hmm. can say they've captured eight thousand fugitives across the world too like this he's he's been all over he's captured fugitives of mexico yeah i mean he's he's definitely a a real bounty hunter and And, i think i mean Bounty hunting is kind of an interesting thing, how it all works, because it's not like he has to be invited to help with the investigation. Right. He, if you have a certain amount of cred- credentials, you're allowed to just jump well, if in. You, on there's any wanted case. people. Yeah, you can just go look for them. But yep. obviously, it's mm-hmm. dangerous and there's a lot of risk to doing it. I have mm-hmm. a question because I'm not, I don't want to sound stupid, but I'm not very familiar with bounty hunters. So there's not like a specific like training or like it's something like self proclaimed yeah. essentially. Okay. Yeah, it's almost like becoming a private investigator, but I guess you'd have more training in that too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, for him, it's really his record speaks for himself, right. so he's exactly. able to get into any case, no problem. Totally. I mean, a lot of bounty hunters though are hunting down people that skip bail and things mm-hmm. like that. I mean, they're they're not necessarily looking for FBI's most wanted per se, but there are. I mean, there are bounty hunters that. I mean, a lot of bounty hunters work for bondsmen. Is, is really what a lot of them do. Mm-hmm. And they work in that capacity. But there are bounty hunters that go after, you know, serious criminals. Yeah. Because I lost a daughter at the, about the same age, that's, I know what the parents feel like, okay? And you want justification. You want the guy behind bars. All of it's alleged that he even committed the murder. But uh, circumstantially, it looks like he did. You know, the strongest lead I see is that one of her friends said he had been in the Appalachian Mountains by himself for a couple months. 
Now, he's not just a camper then. He is a outdoorsman. So in order to do that, I think because of his age, he felt comfortable. If there's anywhere right now that looks the hottest, that could be the area. It all depends on the picture they got of him the other day where they're hunting now. If really that was him, no one has said that. If not, Appalachian Mountains is the best, but it covers several states. So where did he go in at? That's where you start your tracking point. From right when he went into the mountain with dogs, they've got so much infrared. I mean, they're gonna catch him. You know, I, the only reason I, I would doubt if he's in the swamp is they've been hunting it really good, okay? And I'm not sure that was him in the picture. You know, they was blurry, blah, 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 like kind of an old bank robbery picture, right? But you couldn't really tell if that was him. Now, if that was him 100%, he's in the swamp, okay? And then, so they, he, he moves in the, in the night and he probably sleeps up in the day. Now, the FBI has ultraviolet light tracking. Remember the Boston bomber? How they found the kid in the boat when they went over and the tarp was over him? They've got that. So I'm sure they're using that to cover with drones. I mean, he can't cover with mud. It's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. He can't cover with anything. He's gonna light up. So it's interesting what he said about the infrared because I have heard other ex-FBI or experts that have been on various news shows saying that they've had some trouble because some of the area is just so thick that they can't see all the way down. Mm -hmm. But it does, it is interesting when you think about the case of the Boston bomber. Remember how he was hiding in the boat in the backyard and they, I mean, mm -hmm. they do have incredible technology. It, it, it's hard to believe after a week out there that he could still be out there. But of course, I mean, he could, he could. But how smart is this guy? How prepared was That's he? That's what I'm saying. You're in a fucking swamp. It's dangerous as it is. Yeah. It's hot as shit. Apparently you, he left, what did he leave with gallons and gallons of water and yeah. food? Like Unless he had one of those purification yeah, devices or straws or bottles or something on him, which he would probably be the type to yeah. carry something True. like that. But it, I don't know. I, I think... I don't know. This is where we get speculative. And of course, I want to just continue to say these are our personal ideas and thoughts, just throwing things out here. I just my gut tells me he parked outside of the the Carlton Reserve as a setup. He walked around in there, dropped some shit, did a little hike why would for a you, day or two yeah. and then moved on. Well, why would you set that up if you're actually hiding in there? Yeah. Why would you literally you like your car out? It's like putting right? a yeah. flag. I'm out yeah. here. Come yep. and find me. Like I maybe, agree. maybe mm -hmm. that's what he did. But to me, it seems like I, I think he's like five steps ahead of, yeah. of where police are at right now. I think, yeah. I think that was a setup. And I think, I think dog bounty hunter is pretty spot on. I think that the okay, next yeah. place they should go look is start, start figuring out where in the Appalachian mountains he yeah. was before. Mm -hmm. yep. Cause if you I'm know sure where he, he was sure before, that, yeah. then he would be familiar with that area. He spent multiple months out. He would mm -hmm. know where to go to find water to survive. He would, he could go replicate what he did before. So it yeah. seems to me that that's probably the most probable place that you're going to find him yeah. is where he's already been successfully living in for multiple months, mm -hmm. sort of off the grid. I mean, the Appalachian mountains are, it's a huge area of land and you could very easily just disappear. It and, seems like the strongest theory so far, yeah. but that's also because we don't know a mm -hmm. lot and we don't know if, dog knows everything i mean no. he probably doesn't know well and police said that they have good intelligence together. that suggests that he's in the carlton reserve or nearby yeah. and then that trail cam photo that came out which police have confirmed was not brian was interesting and that yeah. was in another area of florida uh completely that i yeah. mean there were some similarities in the person in the photo and how they looked compared to brian people compared his backpacks his backpack mm -hmm. looks similar so could it have been him potentially but Mm -hmm. Again, I, I believe police have ruled that out. That There's also been a lot of speculation that he left the country, either to Canada or Mexico. But let's continue this interview. Dog kind of talks about why he doesn't think that's as likely. You know, I don't think he went to New York or uh, there's been a couple rumors he might have went to Mexico. I've been in Mexico. So if he's down there wanted a white boy that doesn't know Spanish, the cartel's going to grab him for the reward. So no, he's not down there. You know, I don't think, who knows? I've had to eat my words before. 
sounds like when they got into argument, she screamed a lot. Now, if he's out in that tent, your voice will go, what, two miles? And she's screaming. What if he put his hand over her mouth to shut her up and killed her? Or did he do it worse? It all depends. The autopsy report is out, I believe, how she died, okay? That's going to be your murder uh, death penalty sentence. So how do you say it could have been an accident? You know, the guy that uh, killed my daughter in, an ac in a car wreck, right? He passed too, but it was an accident. How do you say that? So, but right now we got to hunt him as a wanted fugitive. So the reason I went to Mr. Landry is because I carry a reputation with me. See me every night on Pluto TV. The reputation is he gives you a second chance. He gonna get you, but he gives you a second chance. So I thought, wow, the dad's gonna, you know, see me and crack. And I know the kid knows me, probably one of my fans. So I thought the dad would answer and talk, but I was very persistent without disturbing the peace and knocked a few times. So they saw it was me and I didn't play nasty and put a copy of the warrant on their front door, none of that. I was very respectful. And the dad can still reach out to me through social media. Let's get the kid captured alive. Alive. My, we're, so the next step that I have is to, now we work off leads, okay? We don't have a crystal ball where we can say, oh, there's where he's at. Well, now we work off leads. Somebody knows something. Somebody else knows where he's at, where they dropped him off at, or did they drop him off? That person is going to call us because, again, we're not the police. This is anonymous. We don't have to tell. We are willing to go to extreme measures to find him, whether it's in Mexico. I've got connections there or anywhere. I think, again, that he's young enough, not an experienced criminal. But what is his greatest experience? OK, outdoorsman. That's what he does the best. I don't think he can shoplift and live in the city and be on the run and, you know, sleep at cheap hotels. I think that he is what's in his blood. He's in them hills. On a one to 10, he's probably a six compared to the outdoors men and some of the guys that I've captured. Okay, those two New York guys, the one that killed the other guy was, we was 10 minutes behind him. That's good stuff. So not, this guy's not experienced like that. We get a scent of a trail. We get a scent he's done. He's not gonna hide in the trees and dig a cave and all that. He's got a small tent, maybe a knife, cause he's gotta stay out in the open. Hope parents didn't give him anything else to protect himself. How's he eating? Gotta kill the game. So, you know, just don't walk up on him and say, hey, you're wanted, freeze. Pretty I, interesting. Yeah, I thought he had some good points in there. I think the points about why, you know, reasons for why he wouldn't go to Mexico are pretty valid. Yeah, I mean, he's clearly speaking from experience, too. Yeah. He's done this so I mean, many Brian's times. Brian's face is all over the internet, all over the news. So, yeah, if the cartel is like, oh, easy money, you know, pick up somebody like that. I don't think, I think he's likely in the Appalachian Mountains or Wouldn't it be wild if he'd area. be the one to find him? That would be wild. That'd be a wild end to it. And then he did mention that the autopsy report was released, which it was just the, the release was mm -hmm. just the fact the that they determined it was homicide, but the actual autopsy yeah. results won't be ready for up to three weeks. Yeah. So he sounded a little bit confused there. I don't know. Anyway, um, Friday, September 24th, right before the weekend, the last update came in from the Northport police department on Twitter they said they are continuing to search the Carlton Reserve over the weekend, focusing on the areas where they believe Brian would be or could have been. Um, we'll go ahead and play one last clip from the Northport Police Department explaining kind of what it's been like for them out there. Well, the warrant doesn't change anything for us. We're working as hard to find them now as we did on day one. We've been deploying all the resources that we had available to us, um, all the staff. And these guys, their drive to find them on day one is the same as today, regardless of the warrant. The staff that are out there searching, they get home and they're exhausted. They're out here working as hard as they can. And I tell you, the only break they have during the day is when they come back to get a bite to eat, and then they go back into the wilderness and they hit it hard again. 
when they get home, they shower, wash off the dirt from the day, and that's probably about the amount of energy that they have before they have to wake up and come back out for the next day. Uh, but it's it's wearing. I mean, this is wearing on everyone. This is wearing on everyone. Everybody has a, a level of stress. Um, everybody has the drive, and that's really what's carrying us through is the drive to try to find Brian and try to put closure to this investigation. What are the types of areas we're, we're, we're looking through? We're looking through wooded areas. We're looking through bodies of water. We're looking through um, swampy areas, um, and we're deploying the resources to be able to do that. We have air units. We have drones. We have the swamp buggies, air boats, multiple law enforcement agencies. We have ATVs. We have UTVs and we have officers on foot as well. So we're deploying every resource to get through any terrain that we encounter in our search areas. Why is it important? I mean, we're certainly hearing a lot of feedback that we're wasting our time. Why is it important that we do this? So what I would say to the public is there are many, many more resources we're deploying in here other than the search efforts that we're seeing here today. Uh, we have investigative means, we have other technology um, agencies are issuing search warrants um, for for data, uh, whether it be social media or some other uh, investigative means, um, and then we do the search. So we're not wasting our time out here. We're, we are doing our due diligence to find Brian and an area that intelligence had led us that he could possibly be in. And it's upon us to make sure that we search this area as best as we can, as, as massive as it is with the resources that we have to try to find Brian. Tons of tips have obviously come in from people who believe that they have spotted Brian, such as an alleged sighting outside of a hotel in Canada, and another still image from a video camera. We'll put those in, but police have not announced any confirmed sightings. Then Saturday, September 25th, media confirmed with the Northport Police Department that the Carlton Reserve search has been scaled back a bit. Investigators are now concentrating on bodies of water, which involves fewer officers. On Sunday, the day we were recording, September 26th, the Laundry family attorney confirmed that an FBI agent did enter their home and got personal belongings of Brian's for his from his daily routine for DNA matching. We don't know why they're asking for this. I'm sure there's a bunch of reasons why they could want this information. It's probably just standard protocol. Gabby's murder would become part of a cold case if Brian somehow managed to flee the country under a new identity which is still a possibility mm -hmm. we don't know mm -hmm. i mean he was just a person of interest for quite a while and mm -hmm. it seems like at least a week or two went by where pretty much nobody knew where or what Ridiculous. he was doing Ugh, that would be so upsetting i mean that hasn't even i haven't even let that cross my mind yet that he might just get away forever mm -hmm. that makes me want to throw up thinking about that in my mind he's got to it's going to be maybe it'll be a few weeks maybe a few months but He's got to, someone's eventually going to find this guy, right? Come on. I don't know. I don't know. <sighs> None of us know. It's just like insanely frustrating thinking that he, this could have been prevented and he might just get away with all of this. So the FBI is still asking the public for help. The warrant allows law enforcement to arrest Brian, but they need more information to build a criminal case for homicide. Anyone who was in the Spread Creek dispersed camping area between August 27th and August 30th are asked to come forward with possible information. If you have any tip, even if it may seem insignificant to you, call 1-800-CALL-FBI, or you can upload the photos at fbi.gov slash petito. If Brian Laundrie is seen, call 911 immediately. Do not hesitate. And then as of recording this episode today, Sunday, September 26th, there was a memorial service for Gabby. Mm -hmm. um, part of the service was open to the public. It was also live streamed. I believe it's part on of it. YouTube. Yeah. Uh, we'll put the link for it it's below. It's very quiet and most of the sound is cut out of it, but it's it looked like a beautiful moment. The family has asked that if you feel, you know, you want to send your condolences or help them in any way, that instead of sending flowers, they'd like donations instead to their new foundation in Gabby's honor, which we spoke about at the beginning of the episode. It's the Gabby Petito Foundation. It can be found at gabbypetitofoundation.org. There's also two other places that you can donate that are safe to donate to. There's a GoFundMe, which we'll have linked below, which was organized by a family friend. And then the John F. McNamara Foundation or the Johnny Mac Foundation. Um, but now that they have their foundation, I'm sure it's best to just donate directly to them. But please be aware that there are tons of fake 
fundraisers and yeah, just be careful. Fake, um, like uh, Venmo accounts and things like that. So just be really careful about where you donate. Funds are being used to bring Gabby home, transportation costs, legal fees, and support to family members. And then leftover funds from the GoFundMe are going to be donated to da- Gabby's foundation to help other people who are in a similar situation. But that is all that we know as of today. Yeah, at this point, we're waiting for the autopsy results to be uh, revealed, the full mm-hmm. extent of it, the cause of death. And mm-hmm. then obviously the manhunt for Brian continues. Yeah. And we'll see where you know where police search next after the Carlton Reserve. It seems like at this point, though, the Northport police are kind of wrapping up their search of the Carlton Reserve. I think they're kind of, you know, I mean, they've exhausted tons and tons of resources. In fact, I think the numbers came out financially the cost to do yeah. this was 200,000 per day yeah and they're so at over, over a, a week now so it's over a million in costs and that's just taxpayer dollars you know and a lot of people have been asking can the laundry family be held responsible for that but that that really never happens you know where a family's held liable they'd have to really prove that they set it all up and and even then the chances of that happening are very slim so it's incredibly frustrating just watching the two of them walk in and out of the house and try to hide yeah they've made the laundry uh, family has made a couple trips to orlando to speak with their lawyer yeah they keep going down there but other than that i mean there's eyes on their house 24 7 they have Mm -hmm. they have to have police there outside of it obviously because people are still you know protesting and there's reporters out there and stuff but yeah news nation has been out there um brian and enton He's been fantastic. If you want some good coverage to follow kind of day by day, he's oh, he posts alerts by the hour on Twitter pretty much and does tons of live streaming right outside of the home. He, if anything's happening at the laundry home, he knows about it and reports on it immediately. Also, uh, WFLA, JB Bruno, B- uh, Buno, what it, yeah, <laughs> what's his name? I don't know. JB Bun- Bono. Anyway, JB, he's awesome. Um, his, his live streams have been great. They've done an excellent job of covering this in a respectful way. He's worked directly with their family, has been giving updates from their family. Uh, so yeah, there's there's some those are probably the best two places to keep up with the case. Yeah, and I mean ultimately we want to find Brian alive and that way he can be questioned and hopefully we mm-hmm. can get some more answers around what what happened to Gabby. Um, I mean, there's a possibility that he's not alive anymore and we're going to end up finding a body or we'll just never find him at all which is honestly really just (sighs) i can't even think about that to think about because it's just so sad i just can't even let my mind go there because that would just be such a oh my god but we'll also continue to update you guys we've we've decided that as because this is just such a big case and Mm -hmm. there's going to be updates that come out in the coming weeks and months probably so we'll try to keep keep you all updated on what's mm-hmm. happening whether that's a full update or a full episode or just an update at the intro of right. a future episode right because i mean i think we all want to see this one through to the end and yeah and, and know what happens because mm-hmm. it's just we got to find this guy he's dangerous he could be dangerous yeah you know yep absolutely so. i mean at the end of the day i mean we need justice for gabby and yeah we can't let this just end in a cold case no it's just not not an option. I just so. have a feeling we're going to eventually find him. I do too. I, I mean, my, and this is purely my, my opinion. I, I think that either a, he's going to get to a point where he just can't survive anymore and he's going to come forward and turn himself in, or they're going to find him somewhere mm-hmm. in the mountains living off grid. Yeah. So I guess we'll just have to see how this plays out. Um, we will. That is it for us today. That is. Thank you for hanging in till the end. I know this one was a tough one to get through. Absolutely. To go over I mean, there's just so many confusing. details and the timeline is still very foggy. Mm-hmm. I mean, we still don't really know the full picture of everything that happened, especially yeah. especially that last week of August into the beginning of September. I mean, we really have no clue what, what happened there. You know, why police not surveil him? Why, did, why wasn't Brian tracked when he did come home? I mean, there's so many questions that... Yeah police still haven't answered and you know there's a lot of anger towards the police and you know this case and stuff and and rightfully so i think they're frustrated that how do you let this guy kind of slip out from under their noses and disappear so i don't i don't know i think there's more to the story that just hasn't been shared with the public that police know and you know i think that brian 
is is i mean he's a narcissist he's clearly smart enough and capable enough of setting this up and disappearing and i mean for all we know the parents are somehow involved in something or hiding information from the authorities yeah. potentially so i guess we'll just have to see what happens with it but yep we will make sure to keep you guys updated and you know definitely check out the gabby petito foundation we'll go ahead and wrap things up here uh we'll see you guys in an upcoming episode of Mahar podcast and until next time keep on taking your mind a mile higher Oh, 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 oh,